today. If you could uh, raise your hand or make yourself known if you're on my list. I see Joe, Mr. Joe Schmidt. Hey, Joe, no lo long time no see. I see Mr. Burgess. So, Commissioner, I, I believe Mr. Schmidt is going to want to comment on action item number three. Uh, if the commissioner would like, he can do that during the action item instead of uh, during this open comment period. Um, I see Seth wants to comment as well. Um, we might as well just take the public comment now okay. during regular comment period. Really? All right, uh, let's see, do we have all three commissioners here? Here, Ken. Ken Bell, present. See, Bobby is not quite here yet. All right, we'll just wait another moment. Hey, Rob, you're not on my screen. Where are you? Um, my screen is the YouTube screen. So you see what whoever's presenting or talking at the current time. Okay. I'm here. I'm not up at the ski area. <laughs> I heard Carrie laugh. So, Commissioner, we have a couple in the chat. Uh, Seth Vidana would like to, I uh, apologize if I butchered your, num your name, but he'd like to provide comment. And then Chip Burgess would also like to provide comment along with Joe Schmidt. Okay. All right. And Commissioner Briscoe is um, on the line now. So we will go ahead and I'm, this is Commissioner Shepard. I am going to uh, open our public meeting. Uh, with roll call. Uh, Commissioner Briscoe? Here. Commissioner Bell? Present. Thank you. And Commissioner Shepard is here as well. All three commissioners are present. This is the Port of Bellingham Board of Commissioners meeting for Tuesday, December 8th, 2020. Last commission meeting of um, this memorable <laughs> year. Um, Whatcom County uh, continues to operate under a public health emergency. Um, and to reduce the spread of uh, coronavirus, we are holding our meetings uh, mostly remotely. There are multiple ways to participate. Um, you can join in to our meeting live uh, via our website with the Zoom login or the conference dial-in. Our meetings are all available afterwards as a recorded link as well. I am going to take a moment to read our upcoming advisory committee meetings. We've got Two, the first is the uh, Bellingham International Airport Advisory Committee. That is the TAC and the BIAC together, January 14th, 4 p.m. via Zoom. And our second advisory committee, the Marine Advisory Committee or the MAC, will be meeting on January 12th at 6 p.m. also via Zoom. We're going to start out with public comment. There is public comment at both 4 p.m. and 5.30. Uh, each person is uh, limited to three minutes, and we try and allocate about 15 minutes total. You can just state your name for the record and where you reside. Uh, we will start out with uh, Mr. Schmidt. There, I think I got my mic on. Oh, 
Um, I just uh, wanted to speak in favor of the uh, ABC recycling coming to the Port of Bellingham. I know this has been a, a long struggle trying to get something here, something going, but I think this is a, a good opportunity to get something going. Um, uh, it sounds like a really good deal. I just, I met with one of the stevedore companies today, just trying to talk about manning and, and trying to put this all together. Um, anyway, I think it's been a long struggle trying to get something here. And I think this, this is really going to do it. Um, I think it'd be good for the port, make some money. Um, and I don't know what else to say. <laughs> Okay. <clears throat> well, I appreciate you being here, Joe, and thanks for your comments. Uh, we'll move on to Mr. Burgess. Michael, could I have one, one second there? Sure. I'd like, Joe, I'd like to thank you and Darren for, uh, for all the work you've done to, to help us get to this point with these folks. Uh, also, the, uh, the support the ILW Local 7 has given us in the last five, six years. Uh, very greatly appreciated. Thank you. Well, thank you. And I've and we've missed Darren. Darren's retired now, so um, I'm on my own. <laughs> <laughs> Some of us miss Darren. <laughs> We're here to help, oh, Joe. Oh, just call. We certainly appreciate um, oh, your contributions. Joe. Thank you. Yeah, welcome. Thanks. Hey, All good right, afternoon, Mr. Richardson from Leona. Yes. Uh, good afternoon, commissioners. My name is Chip. Purgis, I'm a uh, regional representative with the Laborers International Union of North America. Um, in our local jurisdiction, we collectively represent around 1,400 members from Snohomish County to the Canadian border. Uh, with that said, uh, I'm speaking today to encourage the Port Commission to include labor standards in the contract agreement that is proposed uh, between the Port and Cortex Utilities Systems Incorporated. Um, as a representative from the Labor's Union, we support this kind of ecological sound project, especially with the kind of economic development it will bring to the port. Uh, however, with that said, we would prefer that when allocating public funds through the purchasing and procurement process, that any company working on a local public benefit project be held to the public standard for prevailing wages, hours, and working conditions. We appreciate the port commissioners and staff working very hard on this project and look forward to continuing to work with the port on future projects. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Burgess. And we will be discussing that matter more in our um, action item agenda. Thank you. All right, uh, Mr. Vidania. Hello there, uh, Commissioner Seth Bidania. I'm the Climate and Energy Manager for the City of Bellingham. Um, just wanted to take a little bit of your time today to applaud staff at the port and at Corix for pushing toward a low carbon power solution for district heating at the waterfront for this first phase of the build out. I know you'll be talking about that today in your agenda. Um, it's been really good to work with representatives from both organizations, uh, taking the time to engage with us, um, the city, on a solution that will assist um, the city with its climate goals. There's been, a, uh, I'd say, an overall recognition that decisions that are made at the waterfront will have effects on our city's annual greenhouse gas emissions into the next decades, as well as the future of policy development uh, for Bellingham. And stepping out even a bit further, uh, we know that the decisions that we make in our respective organizations and as, as a whole uh, impact more than, than just Bellingham. Um, my perspective is that there are many eyes looking our way and wondering uh, what the future holds for our city and the great opportunity that we have uh, at the waterfront. Um, what happens here um, sends a message to the rest of the world and we I'm ready to assist you all um, with making the waterfront development a model of low carbon planning for the West Coast. So I just wanted to thank you all for your efforts in this area and thank you for your time. Great, nice to see you Seth and thanks for your work with the city on, on this effort. Likewise. All right, um, 
that's all the people I had on my list. Is there anyone else present who would like to provide public comment at this time? Looking through, not hearing from anyone. Rob, do you have anyone else? I do not, sir. Okay. All right, uh, we will go ahead and move on to our consent agenda. Carrie, if you would please. Motion to approve con <laughs> consent agenda items A through L. Okay, are there any uh, questions or comments, uh, Commissioner Briscoe? Oh. Uh, none at this time. And Commissioner Bell? None from me. And all mine are already answered. And so um, you can go ahead and repeat the motion once more, Carrie. Motion to approve consent agenda items A through L. All right, Commissioner Briscoe? Yes. Commissioner Bell? Yes. And Commissioner Shepard is a yes as well. That carries 3-0. Whoever, if, if you could please um, mute your mic if you're not actively speaking, help us with our feedback. Thank you. All right, so consent agenda um, carries 3-0. Move on to our presentations. Uh, first presentation is a waterfront district update and Mr. Gowron. Yeah, good afternoon, Commissioners. Uh, Brian Gowron, Director of Environmental and Planning Services. Um, yeah, I, this is a waterfront district update. It's actually um, a little different than our typical updates in that uh, the majority of the presentation is going to be provided by Harcourt. Um, the Commission had asked for an update from uh, staff on kind of progress on Harcourt's projects. And rather than, you know, playing person in the middle or translator, we thought we'd go ahead and ask Harcourt to to join us and they've got a few slides that they're gonna they're gonna do so but before i do that i do have just a couple of quick updates um and most of these i'll be coming back to the commission um, or staff will to provide a more detailed discussions later next year but um you know we're continuing to see a lot of great activity in the waterfront district as a whole um, including a couple action items on tonight's agenda the abc recycling project it mentioned earlier uh, in the log pond area as well as the corex um, uh, a district energy system, both which are exciting and great, um, great um, opportunities to, to see progress in the waterfront district. So um, in addition to that, you know, the port is continuing to support interim uses uh, in the waterfront district, uh, things like um, the, the bike park, uh, an expansion of the uh, public lawn that's being constructed right now over by the digesters, which should be ready next spring. Um, the, uh, they're actually installing a, um, a, a temporary or a, a a restroom that's more than more than porta potties, but is temporary. It has uh, flush, flushing toilets, running water, that sort of thing, uh, and a number of other projects. We're trying to support the interim uses in the waterfront district. Um, we're also making good progress uh, on the Lignin parcel um, in our partnership on the integrated planning grant with the Department of Ecology uh, and um, and Millworks Food Campus and affordable housing. We'll have a, a specific update on that uh, at an upcoming commission meeting uh, in January. Um, and then uh, as well as uh, progress in the marine trades area across the waterway, where we're working on expanding uh, the marine trades into uh, the former ASB, a portion of the former ASB with uh, in conjunction with the Whatcom waterway phase two cleanup. And that, that was another project where we'll have a much more detailed uh, discussion with the commission uh, early next year. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Des Dennehy. He's the uh, chief operating officer for Harcourt's US operations. Des is is based out of Bellingham, um, but he has uh, been and he was working in Bellingham for a number of months uh, before going back to Ireland in uh, February of last of 2020, right before COVID happened, and has been there uh, since due to um, some international travel restrictions related to COVID. But we do can, we do work closely together, um, uh, talk almost daily, uh, uh, moving projects forward. Um, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to him and just keep in mind that Ireland is eight hours ahead right now. So technically uh, it's tomorrow. And so he's coming to us from the future and, uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll pass it over to Des. Thank you, Brian. Um, I have a few slides to share, just update, but um, uh, thank you for having us. Um, I just, if you can bear with me, I'm going to try and get these slides to present. Dust, would you like me to slow this? You got it. Mm -hmm. Never mind. Um, have they come up or can you see them or? Yep, we got them. Okay. So if you. Yeah. And tell us who Veronica is. 
Okay, well, uh, let me. I, I start with the mystery. So my wife used my computer last week uh, because she's a school teacher, and for some reason now, every presentation and uh, every Zoom call I come on, I am now Veronica. So uh, I suppose she's she's my boss. Um, yes, uh, it was funny. I just noticed that it, it was this time last year as well when I took up the role as COO for uh, Harcourt Developments and spoke at the. Uh, Commissioner's meeting then. Um, I suppose I'd like to start uh, and thank you all, uh, thank the commissioners and, and the staff and the port for making me feel welcome, uh, helping and assisting us in, in all that we're trying to achieve and do down here and all the hard work and um, just general help in getting things moving as we have. Uh, I suppose to start off, um, what I've done is I've divided up, so we, as you know, the master plan for the waterfront was um, passed by the city of Bellingham uh, in December of 19 uh, and came into being on the 1st of February 20. And this basically set the framework for the development of the waterfront site. What we've done since is we've taken this master plan uh, and now developed it further into a, a working schedule of projects that we will be working through over the course of this year to try and start uh, the various developments as uh, you can see outlined on that uh, slide. Um, if we start with uh, the first uh, building and, and the most visual, well, sorry, the, the completed building, that would be the granary building at the entrance to the waterfront uh, district. Uh, that building was completely referred by Harcourt and extended. And we're delighted to say now that it, it's approximately 80% less. So all the upper floors, uh, as you see on that building, are now um, leased, completely leased, uh, with uh, an announcement today that we've just, uh, or we've agreed to lease 13,500 square feet uh, to an international IT company called Cobra Supply Chain. Um, we've been working on that um, letting and that project till since February of 20, uh, COVID didn't help us, but uh, the good news to this letting is that it will be bringing approximately 120 jobs to the downtown waterfront area, high-tech jobs. Um, they intend to take occupation um, post a, a, a quite a, a detailed fit out by Harcourt. They're intending to uh, take occupation probably quarter, the start of quarter three next year. So the target date for their occupation is now uh, August, September 21. Um, besides that, the ground floor um, is, is the last of what's available in the granary building. Um, COVID has materially impacted, as we know, the, the food and beverage um, sector quite hard. But in saying that, we have leased uh, one unit, which is open now to Artovan Mead, which is a brewing company. Uh, we have agreed a lease now for a new uh, coffee operation to open uh, from Seattle uh, beside them. And we're in active discussions with two other potential tenants. And that will see 40% of the ground floor of the um, granary leased. Um, we are also speaking to uh, a pub operator about taking what you can see in the picture there, which is the large bar and deck area as well. So really, uh, things are looking up. Uh, we're starting to see uh, good traction now from the food and beverage sector as, as I suppose, we're, we're moving uh, into a, a new phase in, lock in uh, this COVID crisis, and they're starting to be more positive on the outlook for 21. Um, the next project is the Waterfront Living Project, which we'll see it is build 103 does, condo units. Des, I'm sorry uh, to interrupt. It does. We're, can you move the slides? We're still stuck on the yeah. first slide. Uh, I'm, I'm on number four slide here. Is anyone else seeing four? Is it just me that's stuck on I, the first? We're stuck on the downtown Waterfront Bellingham slide. I think you have to go up to slideshow and say from the beginning. Yeah, I've, I've done that now. It's 
maybe if, if you can you put them up, Rob, That's and, and I'll ask you to move yes. them forward because. Okay. Oh, sorry. I, I should say I was on the last slide, so that's the that's the end, probably. Um, okay. Here we go. Great. Sorry about this now. So if you move down, I'm and past that. Yes, that's where I am now. Yeah. Or sorry, was... back. Yeah. So um, the the. Next slide is uh, the waterfront, the waterfront living project, which will see us develop 103 condo units uh, on the waterfront, right on the edge of the waterfront. Um, it's divided into three blocks. It's about 182,600 square feet of development, um, and there'll be 32,000 uh, square feet of commercial at ground level with 192 basement car parks. Uh, as you've probably seen in the local press, uh, these three blocks, we softly marketed uh, block A and it is now fully reserved um, with m most units having more than two to three reservations. And we're now starting to um, accept inquiries in relation to block B, which uh, was launched on Monday. We're starting to see good traction on that as well. Um, there, uh, we also have two parties interested in commercial space there again which again is another positive in showing that the downtown waterfront is, is, is quite an attractive location to not just residential but commercial users as well. Um, on the next slide, uh, just this, uh, sorry, just I was going to say that uh, we've also appointed uh, Enervate uh, as a district energy consultant uh, that we've used on a, a couple of occasions and developments in the UK and in Europe, and they've assisted us in. Uh, interpreting and understanding um, the COREX requirements and being able to integrate these this district energy system into our designs so that we can we can get uh, offer our end users environmental um, solution to heating and cooling. Um, the next slide is our next project, which is uh, the board mill building. The board mill building, um, our intention here is to retain the existing structure, fully uh, renovate and repurpose it into a, a new 208 bedroom hotel with a purpose built uh, conferencing facility measuring 12 and a half thousand square feet and a 7,000 square foot banqueting facility, along with the um, usual bar and restaurant facilities that you would expect in a hotel at this standard. Um, There'll be undercroft car parking as well, and this hotel will have pretty uh, strong views through the various viewing corridors to the waterfront and across Bellingham Bay. Um, the hotel, we see it as uh, not only just a tourist attraction, but also um, the facilities that are on offer are quite appealing and, and to commercial use as well which we have established across various other hotels that we own within the group, such that the conferencing facility will be large enough to hold the likes of various launches and corporate events. Uh, one of the photos we show there is where Vauxhall have actually launched uh, new models of cars in the Titanic Hotel in Liverpool, uh, to which the board mill will be modeled as close as possible to. Uh, and this is able to facilitate the cars within the conferencing facility, as well as uh, the people and hosting the um, the uh, event. Uh, if you want to go to the next slide. The next uh, project uh, as well will be the alcohol plant. And again, we're looking to repurpose the existing structure there, which measures about 35,000 square feet. Uh, we're looking to probably extend it to a range of about 45,000 square feet. And here uh, we're in discussions with two to three potential occupiers to develop a leisure facility, which will include rock climbing facilities, gym, restaurant, and some co-working space. And again, to add to the attractiveness of the downtown waterfront area, but also to bring leisure facilities to the other occupiers within the downtown waterfront location. Um, you want to go to the next slide, Rob? Um, 
this this slide uh, is the uh, slide for early living, uh, and the next slide is senior living. So, our intention here is to develop um, uh, a new development with about 600 bedroom purpose built early living facility for uh, like co living for young couples and single start outs. Um, and we'll have communal facilities as well as dedicated um, unit facilities, uh, such, a, um, such as you would expect in tech cities and large urban areas. Um, one, of, one of the things that we've learned from COVID or the, since the COVID crisis is that lifestyle cities are now becoming more and more important and, and Bellingham can be seen as one of these and the waterfront district especially. Um, Wellness has come. Wellness and access to facilities and access to open space are becoming more and more important to employers, uh, as well as the employees, uh, where the work-life balance is starting to change. And this meeting is an example whereby it's being carried out by Zoom um, during this crisis. Um, the downtown facility in its parkland setting is ideal for this type of requirement. Uh, it's got good access to amenities, it's got great access to outdoor pursuits. It's It's got an infrastructure, a strong infrastructure, but it also has significant cost advantages. This will, this will bode well over the coming years now as we try to attract more new people to live and work in the downtown waterfront location. And this early living facility will be one such facility that will be able to accommodate uh, these new um, uh, individuals and people. Um, the next slide, which will tie into this as well, if we move on, is for a project for early living memory, or sorry, uh, memory care and senior and assisted living, which will be located uh, basically across the road, but in a building next to this. This will be a, a 200 specialised unit development. Um, we will be announcing in the new year a joint venture for both these projects where we have been in long in discussions for two to three years now with service providers to develop these facilities. Um, this would be a service provider who's well used to not only developing but operating and running these facilities. Um, this memory care unit will have um, service provision via medical and diagnostic um, operations at the ground level. And the beauty of this development is they will be available to a public uh, space or public side through open shop fronts, as well as to the uh, facility itself. And that will integrate it greater into the urban context of what the urban or the urban context of what the downtown waterfront development is to develop as. Um, then finally, I think the next slide are you allowed to tell us who that um, dementia care center is? Uh, we can't just yet, Ken, because uh, we're, we are probably some time off getting the, the final joint venture agreement signed. Is, but, it, um, is it a Washington-based business? Uh, no, it'll be a, a larger business than that. It'll be a national operator. Okay. All right, thanks. If you could move forward, Rob. Okay, and and this is this is uh, one of the central pieces to all this. And and as I touched on, uh, since the COVID crisis, it's become more and more uh, apparent that people's work-life balance has changed significantly. And with all these developments that I've just ran through, all ties into this office and commercial campus. Um, that we'll be looking to develop on the plot as well. Um, these will be modern grade A offices, uh, flexible floor plates uh, with all what you would expect in, a, in a, a major urban city, but located in what I would see as a, as a lifestyle city location. These will all be supported by the fact that um, they are set in an urban but yet a parkland environment uh, with plenty of open space, clean air, good network, good cycling network, and 
smaller footprints, which we're starting to see larger occupiers looking to reduce to. And I think this would be the key to driving um, Bellingham on and the whole downtown project on where we will be uh, appointing a national agent um, to seek occupiers uh, over the next year that would be interested in moving into uh, these offices and this space. Um, we are actually uh, talking to one potential occupier, but at this point, uh, their space requirement wouldn't be big enough to allow us uh, commence on site straight away. Um, this entire package, as, as you've seen, and I've run through quite quickly, is, is, is really uh, the, the piece that Cobra latched onto as well, and which attracted them to the downtown waterfront, was all this uh, seamless integration between um, living, leisure, outdoor pursuits, working, uh, with a strong cost advantage to both them as a business and their employees uh, as occupiers of these properties going forward. Uh, and that's really everything. Um, thank you. All right, thank you, Des. Uh, I'll, why don't you keep it on that slide there so we can um, look at the orientation of buildings. I'll open it up for questions or comments. Uh, let's start with uh, you, Commissioner Briscoe. Hey, Des, good evening or good morning over there, I guess. Uh, we do. Say uh, your time frame for all of this. We were, you, you went through a lot, you showed a lot. It's a big project. Do you feel that the time time frame is is moving ahead faster now than uh, than was anticipated? Um, I, I would think the, the time frame we are moving on. Uh, to be fair, uh, I can't take the credit for all this. A lot of these projects were in in the hopper as such when I joined. So as I said, the joint venture with the uh, senior living and the early living operators uh, was in discussions for probably a year or two. I think where you're seeing things moving on now is the fact that the local area plan is now in place, um, the various infrastructures in place, and now is the time to start moving on with the uh, various projects, which is the next natural step or element to these things. So I would think that, yeah, things will start moving at a quicker pace, but again, this will all be down to design, agreements, permitting, and then getting to site as such. So while there'll be a lot of work done in the background, um, I can't say just yet when you would actually see each project breaking ground. Right, so the, the, the you know, most people like to see things happening, and I think that's been part of the problem. Uh, and you've kind of explained that with this stuff is, these things have been in the works a couple of years in discussions before you can move forward or talk about it. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you gave this presentation. Uh, I think uh, personally it breathes a, a breath of fresh air into the project site down there. I've always had confidence that you guys can get the job done. And I think we're going to start seeing that happen now. Thank you, uh, Des, and, and thank you, Harcourt. Thank you. Thank you, Bobby. All right, uh, Commissioner Bell. I think Bobby just said everything I needed to say. So double what Bobby said, I'm good, thanks. Okay. Um, Des, one of the common questions we, we hear from the public is uh, about uh, workforce housing. Um, we, as you know, we have a housing crunch in our community and there's a particular need for housing that is available to a variety of incomes. Can you talk about how some of these products, maybe the early living and maybe something else can have opportunities for people of diverse incomes? We know we know the waterfront condos are, are going for a particular price point um, that is, is unique for being on the waterfront. And I would hope that there would be a variety of other income levels that could approach um, five minutes to run away. approach um, utilization of residential huh? uh, properties elsewhere. I'm finished five minutes. Uh, 
Yeah, um, so the, multi, the multi-family apartments, um, as you know, as part of the development, uh, the local development plan, um, there, there will be um, uh, a percentage, there is a percentage requirement to provide for social and um, sorry, what we call in this side of the world, social and affordable housing. Uh, and that will have to be met on the site. Um, there will be, this will be addressed with both the multi-family piece, but also then uh, we have another building, as you can see to the side there as well, that can be allocated towards social housing. The social housing piece, um, that we speak of on the affordable, the affordable housing piece. Um, we haven't addressed it at the first phase, as in what you see now, but we are in the process of looking at it uh, next year and we have appointed actually um, CBRE to give us, uh, bring us up to speed and give us a model and a funding model as to how we'll be able to deliver this on site uh, before we come in front of the, yourselves, the commissioners, with a proposal for that element of the project. Um, so unfortunately, I can't give you a very clear answer now, uh, Mike, but that is something that is started on and one that we're conscious that we were going to have to provide within the site as we move forward. Um, and and it's, it's, it's quite, what I will say is it, 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 it's uh, something that's quite important to Harcourt because as you know, it takes all mixes to make an urban environment. Yeah, I very much agree with that. Um, and I just, you know, I want to communicate it's a message that we have been hearing over and over again. And so um, I want to make sure that that message from the public is heard and communicated to you that there is interest and need in our community for that mixed affordable housing. Yeah, just, as, as I said, we, we this is something that we do want to address in the next year as part of then move on to these phases that you see here on this map. Okay. Uh, um, an another question for the uh, senior living uh, memory care. Um, you know, I, I know this topic has come up before and every time it comes up, I always have the same reactions is why, why the waterfront where I know, I know that will make money, but um, that, seems like that could go um, anywhere in our community, whereas we we do have a interest in utilizing this downtown waterfront to really activate the economic development potential of our community, to spur those 21st century jobs that are gonna allow people to, to really work and thrive here. And assisted living doesn't bring any of those concepts to mind <laughs> for me. Um, yeah. Um, well, uh, how, old, how old are you? <laughs> well, I, what I ask is, is they're trying to bring everybody to the waterfront, Michael, and you just said you'd like to have the other folks there. What is wrong with having the senior folks there as well? And by the way, if I'm losing my memory, man, if I could walk out in the morning and see that. I mean, if it's a beautiful location, and, and I, I get that we want to have a diverse community there, which is important. And, and coming across we also want to make sure we're tapping into job creation that are well, high paying jobs, more of those type that you're bringing into the granary building with those IT um, sector jobs. Those are, those, those are going to pay living wages, whereas somebody who provides um, support at a nursing facility doesn't always have that same type of um, uh, compensation. I'm kind of confused. How can you argue for low income housing? Right. Argue against this. Michael, the, the, come on, look in the mirror, dude. The, the, the one thing I would say about, about it is that what we've seen um, in, in some of our other projects and placemaking projects where, where we do have senior living in the mix, is it provides, um, how do I say, a mix that's that's uh, beneficial to all. You have seen uh, the benefit of grey haired, as I am, uh, seniors uh, with younger techies. Um, and I've even seen places where senior living is blended with student housing just to be able to uh, share that dynamic. So 
I, I think senior living brings an element of uh, urban rich culture to a place making project like this. Um, and, and you'd be surprised um, uh, how integrated it will become with these techie, young, high paying jobs that basically I could have gone for one, but I'm just a couple of years too old for it now. <laughs> but only a couple, I might add. Like I'm just barely outside it. And quite frankly, um, this is your project, right? So you guys do what you think you need to do. But um, I have no objection to this because I think integrating this into this community is an amazing thing. Um, thank you for your effort. And I, and I would say that the, the percentages of the, the housing that Commissioner Shepard is speaking to are already laid out. So we don't need to whip that horse anymore. I think, as Ken said, this is Harcourt's project. I think what they've shown us here is, is very good. And I, I would like to think that the younger people aren't forgetting about the older people. You can get along and talk with them and you can get knowledge from both sectors. And that, that's coming from two gray haired guys. Um, tell, tell me a little bit more about the alcohol plant. Um, the estimates I've seen is somewhere in the nature of 14 million to refurbish that. Is do you think that's compatible with uh, making it profitable to use as a rock climbing gym? Uh, well, I suppose I haven't seen the estimates of, of, of 14 million uh, to refer, but it's it's it's. Uh, I think our our initial study. So 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 far we've done an initial study on the structure. We've done an initial study on the model. The structure is is relatively sound. The roof has been a problem uh, and has just fallen into further disrepair and has become dangerous. Um, the economics that we, we've been working to so far does make it stack up. But this is more than just a rock climbing gym. If, if you look at it, if you could nearly divide the building in two, the back element of it will be a double height rock climbing element. But the front element will be a fully integrated gym, yoga studios, uh, restaurants, uh, and co-working space. So the blended the blended um, uh, rent or um, capital value of all those so far is making the economic stack up. The positivity, and again, this is testament to the not only the plan but to Bellingham as a city, and and uh, is the fact that we're we're seeing outside of Bellingham, outside of Bellingham operating looking to this and as I said we have two now competitively following this tracking this and have one of the parties has been tracking this project for nearly over two years now and have already issued letters of intent so I'm quite positive yes there will be tweaks because this is subject to the master development agreement needs to take part in the center of the site but yeah no I'm quite positive this will this will stack up as well plus as you see the other projects come on stream, these are all natural customers to an operation like this. Great. Well, my, my last comment is just one that I've said before is um, the, the more you can communicate these plans to the people of Whatcom County, the better. Uh, I think people like being informed as much as possible. And you guys have a lot of plans that are coming um, to greater levels of design and planning stages. And the more we can continue to do presentations like this in other formats that aren't necessarily a commission meeting and give members of the public opportunities to hear and see the, the great drawings you have and the interesting um, ideas you have for this site, I think that uh, folks will really enjoy that and enjoy being able to keep informed. Thank you. I, I agree and, and thank you very much for this. I think it's a well thought out plan. Um, Mr. Power, I see you are on the phone. So thank you for uh, dedicating the resources you have dedicated um, to make this happen. Um, I'd like to reserve one of those dementia care. <laughs> I know. So do me a favor and, and put my name on the room. 
But um, Pat, thank you so much um, for the dedication you have brought to this project. I think this is a great step forward. Thank you. Yeah, many thanks, Ken. Yeah, we've uh, well, it's, there's a lot done, a lot more to do, and um, I appreciate your comments and positive feedback, and more so with the executive team on, on a daily basis as well. Have to be acknowledged. And Pat, thank you for. Uh, I like to echo what Commissioner Bell has said. I know this has been uh, difficult for the people on your end. Uh, the differences in our in our in our lifestyles of the two countries and the, and the governmental groups of the two countries and the permitting processes. Everything's been a challenge. Uh, I'm glad to see you have stuck with it. I think you've done a better job than I would have. I probably would have pulled the plug and walked after all the harassment and the hollering and so on and so forth. Uh, I think in today's world we live in, there's not much patience. A project this big, this big an undertaking takes a lot of patience. It takes patience on the people's part where it's happening to have some patience with the developer, especially when it's right around the world. Uh, so, so thank you uh, for your efforts. I think Des has done a great job. The, the coordination between Des and the, and the port uh, has been great. It's something that was lacking early on and you guys corrected it. Uh, so thank you. And uh, I think that uh, this type, as Michael said, this type of, uh, uh, well, for lack of words here, you're bringing it forward to us in this kind of a uh, picturesque display, if you will, for people. It, it really helps you understand what you're, what you're trying to do. So thank you. Yeah, likewise. Thank you, Commissioner Briscoe, for the, those uh, kind words. And um, yeah, as uh, to echo what the, uh, you're all saying there, we we keep uh, both yourselves and, and the community informed as we go along. And the more participation uh, that we can have and um, information on the two way street, the better for for us all. And um, yes, we, we we've stuck with it, and 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 pretty much yes, if. Development is is a, a medium, even a long-term game, but the reality of it is when it's all said and done, whatever trials and tribulations or hurdles we've got to jump in the meantime, it'll be all worth it. I'd like to thank Veronica Dennehy for letting me use her name <laughs> during the presentation. Yeah, well done. And, and just for the record, I, I want to make sure my room is on the other end of the building from Bobby. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're going to build me a tower right in the middle. Right up high. <laughs> hey, Pat, I, I, I want to say thank you too for your tenacity. Uh, this has not been easy, and I understand the challenges. So um, we're behind you. Thanks. No, appreciate it. Thank you, Commissioner. Well, thank you, Commissioners. Okay. Um, any other questions or comments here? Thank you both for joining us and especially at the uh, early hour that you are joining us. I recognize that hopefully you guys can get some sleep and sleep in. So thanks again. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Commissioner Shepard. Yeah, thank you. And, and uh, hopefully see you all soon. All right. Okay, um, moving on. Our next presentation is Working Waterfront Task Force Update and Mr. Scott. Uh, Brady, if you're talking, you're muted. Thank you. I was. Um, <clears throat> yeah, good evening, commissioners. I'm Brady Scott, senior property manager with the port, and I believe I've shared my screen. And you can all see that, correct? Yep, we can see it. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, this presentation is another um, progress report on our efforts with the Working Waterfront Coalition to consider a policy to protect marine trade properties at the port. Uh, we're not asking for any formal action today, but are interested in any questions or feedback that uh, the commissioners may have. Uh, to begin, I would like to invite Pete Granger from the coalition uh, to the screen to say a few words about our collaborative efforts to date. Uh, good afternoon, commission members and staff and 
interested parties. I'm Pete Granger, Secretary of the Working Waterfront Coalition. Uh, in introducing this presentation, I want to say what a productive experience it is working with Shirley McFerrin and other port staff members as we discuss and work toward joint recommendations uh, to update the comprehensive scheme for harbor improvement. The staff has been open-minded and working with us in a very cooperative spirit that we really appreciate. We hope that we're being fair-minded and cooperative as well. And we look forward to completing our tasks in the next few months. And I'll turn it over to Jim hey, Kyle Pete. to hey, Pete, give you a few definitions of, th of things we're working on. You said you enjoyed working with Shirley. <laughs> I'll be careful, Ken. <laughs> <laughs> no comment. Well, thank you, Brady and Pete. Uh, am I on here now? Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes. yes. Okay, thank you. Um, three years ago, the commission asked us to work with the real estate division to draft a commercial marine rental policy that would meet two objectives. First, to standardize lease arrangements with maritime companies on harbor lands and buildings. And second, offer a financial incentive to attract maritime companies to our harbor areas. The result was a water reliant commercial marine rental policy, which the commissioners approved unanimously. Commissioner Briscoe was serving at the time, as was Mike McCauley, who gave strong initial support to that effort and who is now contributing as a coalition task force member. As you may recall, that water reliant rental policy set up several criteria that companies would have to meet in order to qualify for the 10% discount. Those criteria are summarized on the left side of the sl a slide. Some of the qualifying uses are boat yards, boat repair services, fish processing plants, and tour and marine taxi companies. There are others too, that's not a complete list, just to give you an idea. So now comes a new joint task force effort with an assignment to redraft the 2013 comprehensive scheme of harbor improvements. Our first order of business was to devise a land use designation that would give the highest degree of protection from non-maritime development. The task force chose to adopt the water reliant criteria from the rental policy for the most stringent protection. Director McFerrin deserves full credit for this wise suggestion. I have to admit I was a bit skeptical in the beginning, but it worked out really well and it greased the skids for this project. Then, as we moved through the planning areas, we discovered the need for a second category for harbor land that does not meet water reliant criteria, but deserves some protection. The result was a maritime contributing designation, which you see defined on the right side of the slide, which calls on the port to require some flexible level of maritime use, but permits non-residential mixed use an example of this standard is the new mixed use project on rotor for which the commission required a component of maritime related use on the ground floor. And we recognize that the commission has all flexibility in applying this standard uh, and applying uh, uh, maritime contributing requirements. And so with that, I'm hoping the brief history shows that there is nothing at all revolutionary in what your task force is proposing. In full cooperation with real estate division, we are simply building out current port practices and culture. And as always, we are grateful to have this place at the table and we thank you again. Um, thank you very much. Yes, thank you, Pete and Jim for um, uh, jumping in there with those words. Go to the next slide. Um, oops. This, uh, you'll recall that um, the policy is really a set of maps um, that show the um, different designations and would direct 
support staff on how to implement its future leasing decisions based on those locations and um, how the properties are designated. Uh, the policy would of course be implemented subject to the authority of the port commission and the port would maintain its absolute flexibility to lease property for however it deems appropriate. And it goes without saying that any property not designated would be subject to this policy. Um, our efforts since we last met was to work on the maps for the central waterfront and Fairhaven areas. This first slide shows the draft map for the Fairhaven area. And uh, based on our discussions with um, the discussions between port staff and the working waterfront coalition, <clears throat> Uh, we are in general agreement about the designations. And at this point, I wanted to invite um, Casey Ohms, who uh, wishes to speak about Fairhaven, if Casey is still with us. Yes, uh, I'm here. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Uh, good evening, commissioners. My name is Casey Ohms. I work for All American Marine and serve on the board of the Working Waterfront Coalition. Um, we kind of went through building by building, parcel by parcel um, in the Fairhaven district and designated uh, various buildings or properties as either water reliant or commercial, or water reliant commercial marine or maritime contributing. And um, really there was, you know, total agreement um, between us and the, and the uh, port. Thank you, uh, Casey. Um, I can just quickly go through. So just to orient you again to the map, the, the white areas are the water reliant use areas, um, which would consist of the, the shipyard, um, the um, cruise terminal and um, the boat launch area, and then the uh, Seaview Fairhaven leasehold area, including the travel lift and float. The um, maritime contributing areas would include the uh, Bellingham cruise terminal, and the warehouse um, for uh, the community boating center, and then um, much of Fairhaven Marine Industrial Park. The reason um, much of Fairhaven Marine Industrial Park is included as maritime contributing and not water reliant is that uh, many of the current uses uh, do not meet the more narrow definition of, of water reliant commercial marine, um, as Jim um, explained earlier. Uh, there's activities like net, net repair, um, net storage, um, small boat manufacturing, um, mold storage, the uses like that that don't uh, uh, necessarily fit the water reliant designation, but which are all marine trade related uses. I'd also like to point out um, this small area here, which is hashed. Um, we added that in subject to our letter of intent with Dominion. Um, which is noted that if that transaction goes through, that area would be deleted out of the map. Um, Can you walk me that small triangle that um, seems to be all the other properties? Uh, you're talking about this? Yes. So that's the parking lot area in used in association with the um, boat launch. Strictly parking? It's uh, it's boat and trailer parking and a restroom uh, facility used um, by the boating public. And what about the surrounding properties there? So we have the train station. Is this what you're talking about here? Well, no, I'm just saying just to the left and to the right. Why weren't they included? Uh, you're talking about these two strips here. And on the other side as well, yes. Yeah, so uh, so uh, uh, to the, I guess that'd be the east, uh, that is, I believe, part of the um, city property or or the, um, the natural area there. Um, this area here is um, the train station, um, the bus station, and as well as the, um, the um, pause for a beer. Uh, facility and so that um, triangle uh, south of the railroad and um, north of Harris uh, does not necessarily um, 
follow suit with the water reliant or maritime contributing uses. I have a question, Brady. Yes. Over to the right, uh, you got uh, water reliant use in the, yeah, in the park there. I'm kind of curious why that line doesn't continue on up the uh, street to the northeast there towards the bluffs and then go out to the tracks and yeah, not, not quite that far back up to and yeah, well too far but anyways to the east of that you've got two boat one major boat building business industry there and then you've got the uh, smaller a couple of smaller ones and it seems to me without water boats are no good without boats water is no good so i don't understand why that section is not water reliant use so the um the current use for building um six is by northwest marine industries they they do build boats which is a marine related use but um they're small boats that leave um, via tra trailering, um, and uh, that company came out of Ferndale and uh, is not technically a water reliant use. It um, uh, doesn't meet that category. The um, Nigel's facility uh, and NTG fabrication uh, is considered a water reliant commercial marine use for the rental policy. So it's an example of where that. Um, is would meet that water reliant use designation, um, but you know future uses of that building um, wouldn't necessarily have to. Uh, but it would still be um, maritime contributing, so it would meet that. Um, would be designated for that um, designation. Well, if we want to keep our boat building industry on the waterfront, there uh, wouldn't that we want that to maintain a water reliant use building. Um, we, this, uh, this policy would not ex exclude that, um, uh, ability to, um, continue to use water reliant uses. So any area that's maritime contributing could those water reliant uses. Um, and so, um, that, this policy wouldn't prohibit that. Okay. So maybe I need to back. Could you explain the policy to me? Maybe I forgot the difference between what we've got in white and what's in the, the lighter pink without the hash lines through it? Sure. So go back two slides. So the water reliant commercial marine use, which came out of our uh, rental policy, has a, a somewhat of a narrow definition um, that has this three part test. So it needs to be a commercial business. Um, it needs to require access to the water. That access to the water is um, either has a foot in the water, like you have a boat lift or a pier, or, um, or is reliant on that sort of infrastructure or your employees require access, say, to the marina. And the third part of that um, definition of, of that um, designation is the majority of that use has to meet, um, has to be commercial marine or requiring access. So it's, it's relatively narrow. Um, so, as we go to the, the waterfront, for instance, like LFS um, has a warehouse. They're certainly a marine business, but that warehouse could could be located uh, elsewhere, not um, requiring access to the water. Um, so that was the reason why a second de a designation called maritime contributing was um, uh, is being proposed by um, the task force um, to um, designate areas that don't quite fit that narrow designation into this broader category, allowing us to still recognize the importance of the marine trades for that area. Okay, thank you. And so Brady, is that why the Community Boating Center is, they don't qualify us because they're a nonprofit? That's correct. They're, they certainly meet all the other requirements of needing access to the water and all that. That's correct. Okay. So maybe one more question, Brady, on, on that particular question, Commissioner Shepherds, what's our rental rate there compared to the, to the white? Um, well, they don't, um, that's a special case really because um, uh, 
Well, one, they're a nonprofit organization, and so we have a separate policy that provides a similar discount that we provide our um, water reliant commercial marine properties. So, so there's that, and then this is also subject to the um, port management area um, and the statutes provided by DNR, and so rents governed by um, by that, and so um, we have to follow, and it's a land um, lease that so we have to follow those somewhat more complicated rules on providing rent for the community voting center. And it is significantly less than the water reliant policy uh, rent standard. Yeah, I think we lowered that when I first became a commissioner, unless I'm incorrect. That's correct. Okay. We can go on to the uh, the next um, photograph that, um, I'm sorry, map that we worked on. This is the Central Waterfront Marine Trades Area. So we looked um, basically from the INJ waterway to the Whatcom waterway. So the areas outside have not yet been mapped. So we're focused on this kind of central area. And you can see again, the color scheme where the water reliant. So you come down Hilton you have Bornsteins and you have All American Marine, Bitter End Boat Works. Those are all water reliant uses. And the future of the ASB would be a water reliant use. You have the C Street Terminal, call, excuse me, Colony Wharf, and other areas, which are all um, water reliant. The um, example I spoke to previously of LFS, um, they um, occupy a good portion of the F Street warehouse. Um, while well, they're marine uh, related use, uh, they're not necessarily water reliant. And so we designated that the maritime contributing designation. Um, another example is the Kochman property um, on the corner of Hilton and Rotor. Uh, here, um, that lease requires the tenant to provide their best effort to lease 25% of their uh, building space for marine trades. So it fits into that um, maritime contributing use uh, as well. And then again, um, pointing out this area that's hashed, um, that's the property owned by Dominion, which we may acquire, in which case it would be designated as a water reliant designation. Just moving forward real quick, um, we did, um, you've seen this map previously, but we updated it now that we have the second designation. So um, the water reliant, the white area is the same as we showed the last meeting. But um, in that meeting, we talked about the properties um, <coughs> street um, on the, on the um, bluff side of Rotor and um, based on commission input at that point and further discussions with uh, um, the task force, we designated those as uh, this maritime contributing use designation. Hey, Brady, uh, can you go back to that last slide? Sure. Okay, just below Inner Harbor where our web lockers are there. And yeah. uh, okay, so we've got you know, where the harbor office is, we've got business in there that are maritime contributing and that is, yeah. that we're not including um, that or what's going on? That area is not yet mapped. Okay, very good. So we're gonna, uh, we stop that, that line basically comes along here. So um, that's actually a good segue to our next slide, which shows the two areas we're going to be uh, working on maps next. So we're gonna be continuing our monthly meeting focusing on the Squalicum Marina uh, down to Bellwether, as well as um, the area um, south of the Whatcom Waterway uh, through the Log Pond and shipping terminal areas. So th those will be our next maps we present to you um, and get additional feedback uh, at that time. And then as you uh, will recall, we'll incorporate uh, these maps and this policy into the draft uh, comp scheme which would be subject to an open public hearing and commission action for approval uh, in the future. And with that, um, any other questions or feedback? Um, we could also provide the maps to the commissioners um, outside of this meeting. 
Thank you, Brady. Appreciate it. Uh, any questions or comments? I have no more. Yeah, Brady, I would love to have those maps, so thank you. Um, yeah, I don't have any other questions or comments. You guys have done a good job keeping us updated on your work. Um, I think we've had a couple presentations, so I appreciate the ongoing effort that's gone into this. And um, I know this is going to make a long-term impact for us. So thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity and, uh, and the further feedback. Are you looking for support? Uh, we're looking for general support and any questions or feedback that you may have for us. Yes. <coughs> I may I may add one more thing then. I, I believe that those two buildings to the east of the Seaview Yard, there should be water reliant buildings. And the reason I say that going into the future, uh, if it is <coughs> if it's listed as water reliant going into the future. There's going to be less chance of non-water reliant businesses being put there. It's going to give people pause to think about, oh, okay, this is a water reliant business area. Maybe we should think a little more about this other business we might want to put there, even though it may be a contributing business. What level does it contribute at just enough? I mean, there's lots of gray areas in the marine contributing part of it so far, but I know it's a work in progress. Yeah, I know we appreciate the uh, the input, uh, Commissioner Bisco. Okay, that's all. I Thank you. All right, thanks. All right, we have uh, one more presentation. Um, I want to just check in with my fellow commissioners if you'd like to take a break now or hold off. We have uh, one more presentation and a five thirty comment period. I'm good to go. I'm good to go too. It doesn't matter to me. Okay. All right. Let's uh, press on. And we have legislative update with Mr. Hogan. Good afternoon, commissioners. Mike Hogan, Public Affairs Administrator. Um, well, today I'm very happy to welcome the port's lobbyists down in Olympia, Ben Buckholtz and Tom McBride. Uh, as you recall, they've represented us for a number of years and done terrific work. Uh, they also represent Whatcom County and the city of Bellingham. And uh, they champion our, our key interests, including uh, MOTCA funding for our cleanup projects and uh, broadband for uh, our rural areas of our county, among others. And uh, we just had an election season. So this is the time of year we like to invite them in and give a preview of what's going on. And especially this year with COVID and uh, how the legislature is going to um, adapt and, and how we can adapt to make sure we're getting the conversations with the 40th and 42nd delegation that we need to. So with that, I'll welcome uh, Tom and Ben. And and Ben, don't think we didn't see that shameless plug for delicious beer at Boundary Bay. I, I believe that's water, <laughs> but we, we did catch that. <laughs> it is water, but I'm glad. He's supporting. <laughs> Anything we can do to help the local economy. That's right. Uh, Thank thanks, you. Mike, C C Commissioners, Executive Director Fix. Um, thanks very much. My name is Tom McBride here with Ben Buckholtz, as you uh, know. We're here today to talk to you about, give you a legislative update. I'm going to cover a little bit about the elections, talk briefly about the uh, 2021 session coming up generally, and then Ben's going to pick up and talk about some of the issues we're expecting to be working on for you in 2021. But, um, you know, you can't uh, start an election up or a legislative update without uh, an election update after this uh, 2020 uh, general election on November 3rd. Um, what is interesting, when you think about the amount of uh, work and, and advertising and attention that went into this election, we came out of this election in Washington State with the exact same margins of control in both the House and Senate. Uh, it, it's remarkable when you think about it. Uh, 5741 Democrats control the House and 2821 Senate uh, Democrats control the Senate. And that's with one Democrat, uh, Tim Sheldon, uh, caucusing with the Republicans. But, um, you know, I think there's a little bit, it, it gets a little more nuanced, uh, even though you see the majority of control staying the same, when you look at the fact that um, uh, there, there's been a, about a 20% 
turnover in the House overall and about a 14 percent turnover in the Senate overall. So a lot of legislators walk away, do something different. So we've got that typical turnover that creates a lot of opportunity and need for people like us to uh, educate our local delegation about the kind of work that we're doing and the kind of help we need during legislative session. Uh, to back up just for a moment, that election that we just went into was about, um, it was the second highest vote turnout in Washington state history, about 84%, second only to the 2008 election. And um, it was interesting because uh, despite that large turnover and the votes, the majority control staying the same, we did have uh, two Democrats and two Republicans uh, who lost their seats. So they did a bit of a flip. And uh, some you'll recognize, Senator Taco and Representative Blake in the 19th district down in, in Longview lost to Republicans. And um, and in the um, on the other side, we had Senator O'Ban in, the, in Pierce County and Representative Van Werven up in the 42nd district, Republicans losing to Democrats. So that's what kept the, the vote count the same uh, two prior years. Governor Inslee was reelected and uh, Secretary of State Wyman, a Republican was reelected re and she is the only uh, statewide elected Republican on the West Coast outside of Alaska. So um, a lot has, has stayed the same uh, after this election. Mark Mullet, who's a senator out of Issaquah, uh, is still in the middle of a recount. I don't think that's been completed quite yet, uh, but it looks like he will hang on to, to keep those numbers the same, as I mentioned. Um, looking at the session itself, uh, Mr. Hogan alluded to it, but it, it is going to be something like we've never seen before. There has been, uh, there's a lot of uncertainty, obviously, and honestly, you're dealing with the same thing here uh, with the port. You know, you're handling this this uh, meeting virtually and people are testifying remotely. That's exactly what is we expect to see happen and what, what's planned to occur in Olympia during the legislative session. They're still working through some of the details. Uh, the assembly days that took place in September and late November, early December gave the legislature and the administration an opportunity to try out some of the technologies they've put in place to manage this legislative session remotely. I mean, uh, there may be some legislators in Olympia, uh, but the plan is to have very few people in Olympia and even fewer people on the floor of either chamber. There may be certain circumstances where people are in remote locations that don't have good uh, Wi-Fi and they need to be in Olympia in order to participate in a meaningful way. Those are some of the negotiations that are going on right now to ensure people have the ability to be there if they need to be there. And there are others who really shouldn't be there for health reasons because they may be in danger uh, of COVID. But uh, there, the plan is to do everything remotely. The hard part will be things like um, the negotiations. How will the budget negotiations occur if the legislature, legislators aren't in the same room working together? You know, because some of that is it's good to be in the same room and see body language and, and the negotiations uh, move along better in that kind of environment. But they're also going to be doing committee hearings remotely. They'll be taking testimony remotely like this. Uh, they'll be doing a floor action uh, online remotely, and they'll be doing voting electronically online. And that is a very concerning element. I think part of the public, lobbyists, others, are a little concerned about our ability to participate in this session remotely. But I can guarantee you there's legislators who are feeling the same way, thinking about committee activity sitting in their uh, seat remotely, will they be able to uh, meaningfully engage with witnesses, ask questions, offer amendments, uh, and take the votes uh, in a, in a um, successful way? So they're working really hard to make sure that comes out okay. I don't think there's any question about that, but we know uh, the, the, the technology can be difficult to work with, and I'm sure there's gonna be some, some hiccups along the way, but they've invested a lot of time and money to make this work. Uh, TVW will be providing live broadcasts of all committee activity and floor activity. Um, and then we'll, um, we'll uh, really, I think from our perspective, one of the things we're most focused on is our ability to offer testimony on bills of interest that you're going to be interested in. And um, they won't be able to take all testimony on all bills. I mean, with, with allowing for remote testimony from around the state, there's going to presumably be more people who are interested in testifying and there just won't, simply won't be time to take everyone's testimony. So uh, that will be difficult for the chair to manage. Um, and then we'll, um, we'll 
be able to likely always submit written testimony. But I, I talk about that a little bit before we get there for the benefit of the of the port and the commissioners, because we're going to need to stay in very close contact with our legislative delegations, the 40th district, the 42nd district. We're need to be we're going to need to be able to contact our legislators quickly uh, to get information to them that they're going to need. And I presume they're going to want to be able to get in touch with us when they have questions about legislation that's moving through the process. So it's going to be a different role for us. We're, we're going to need to be active, we're going to need to be engaged, and we're going to need to be avail available uh, to help our legislators move through the process. So at that point, I will um, turn it over to Ben to hit a little bit on some of the issues, and we're happy to take questions uh, at any time afterward. All right, thanks, Tom. Uh, I appreciate that. Thanks, uh, Commissioner Shepard, for the, for the introduction um, and for allowing us some time to uh, present to the group today. Um, uh, that was a shameless plug for Boundary Bay, one of my favorites when I'm up in the Bellingham area. My wife is from Nooksack, so I get there uh, probably more frequently than I uh, should physically. Um, so I'm just gonna quickly add a couple items that, um, that Tom touched on and maybe expand a little bit on those. Um, and then I'm gonna go into the um, issues that will be priorities for uh, the 2021 legislative session uh, as, as Tom did a good job of outlining and so did uh, Mike Hogan, um, obviously budgets, uh, MACA and broadband transportation issues, we'll touch on all of those. Uh, first off, the uh, committee assignments. Um, this is a little bit inside baseball uh, issue here, but committee assignments are a very important uh, part of the process in the legislature. And uh, as of right now, the House uh, committees are appointed by uh, the Speaker of the House and uh, so a sort of a subcommittee that she chooses. And they just, they determine uh, who will be the chair uh, of each committee. And the latest information we've gotten from uh, the leadership team, Speaker's leadership team, uh, as of about an hour ago, they still uh, were working on a lot of the chair uh, positions who will uh, be in charge of the committees. That's very important um, to the process and who takes over the control of certain committees really has a big impact on some of the issues that we work. And so uh, they were in negotiations until uh, late last night. They came back today and were uh, negotiating on positions for uh, chairs um, and who would uh, take certain places uh, of the committees. So we should have that list, um, I was told, uh, either tonight or early tomorrow morning, hopefully. So uh, it'll probably make the newspapers, I would guess, and I'm sure we'll send out uh, a short update that says uh, here are the chairman, uh, uh, chair people for, for next session. Um, the, the biggest issue that will take up the most amount of time in the 2021 legislative session will be uh, the two-year budget from 2021. Uh, that starts on July 1st, 2021 through um, the end of uh, June, 2023. Uh, that will uh, by, for, by far take up the most amount of time uh, and capacity of legislators uh, during the 2021 session. Uh, we're expecting about a three and a half billion dollar uh, budget shortfall. That number keeps getting better. However, uh, when we first saw the forecast in uh, March, April, it was uh, much worse than three and a half. Uh, and we're starting to hear that it may even be less than that uh, based on how the economy has recovered uh, in, the, in the last couple months. Um, some sectors doing well, and obviously hospitality sectors not, hospitality and, and service sectors not doing well uh, at all. So um, the budget will, will consume the most uh, time uh, followed right behind that obviously will be uh, COVID relief, pandemic relief, um, probably uh, tying for second with uh, police reform discussions. Um, and those are, those are obviously very important discussions and debates that will take place. And uh, it sort of ties back to the comment that, that Tom uh, made about the fact that I think there's a lot of concern uh, this session about uh, everyone having full participation in those uh, conversations and, and floor debate uh, because of the virtual nature of the 2021 session. Um, so then shortly after, uh, you know, budgets will be the, the uh, consume the most amount of time. 
uh, the the next biggest issue that we will uh, be following will be uh, MACA, uh, the, the Model Toxic Control uh, Act, and the funds um, that that we follow every year. I, I sort of sound like a, a broken record uh, every time we present uh, to to uh, the port and, and other Whatcom County folks, but MACA is um, is our highest priority issue. Um, this year, uh, in the 10-year the plan that was released in June, um, it looks like there'll be about $527 million coming from the hazardous substance tax. Um, and from last year, uh, there was a bill passed, Senate Bill um, 5993. Um, that bill uh, made it a tax per 42-gallon uh, barrel of oil at $1.09, $1.09 uh, per 42 uh, gallon barrel. Uh, that number uh, goes into a couple different, uh, that figure gets broken up into a couple different MACA accounts. And uh, right now, the Department of Ecology has requested that 60 million of that money uh, be new money for MACA projects. And about 40 million of that has been earmarked um, or requested by the Department of Ecology to be specific for, um, for ports. Uh, across the state. So a, a big chunk of that 40 million uh, is being requested by DOE for, for new money for uh, Port Bellingham projects. So that's sort of a, that's a big deal. We'll be keeping an eye on that. Um, and obviously uh, part of the coalition and, and part of the conversation all throughout session uh, to make sure that the MACA fund is not rated and swept into the general fund, which has been done in the past. Uh, when there is um, when there is a budget shortfall, the MACA account has a big target on its back. That that's a, a great place to pull money from, and that is constantly what we were talking about with legislators to make sure that they do not pull money from the MACA account into the general uh, fund. Uh, the uh, issue of uh, broadband uh, for rural areas, broadband services that. Uh, is going statewide. It started out um, in, in Whatcom County, but uh, that issue has been picked up by a, a, a broader group of uh, uh, interests. Uh, so we'll be uh, part of the broadband conversation, continue to be part of the broadband conversation going forward. Um, transportation package, there are going to be several, um, several competing interests, uh, proposals uh, coming out pretty soon. Uh, that will um, uh, be a new list of transportation projects for statewide. Um, one of those will be uh, the, the Democrat uh, chair of the House uh, Transportation Committee and a uh, joint proposal with um, the Senate Chairman, uh, Steve Hobbs. Uh, those two gentlemen have been working on outlining um, a, a transportation package uh, proposal that will include an $8 uh, somewhere around an $8 um, uh, uh, carbon tax per metric ton carbon tax um, that would go to directly to fund transportation, a uh, transportation uh, package and the project list that's attached to it. There's also another uh, carbon tax proposal that is more general. It is a $25 a metric ton uh, proposal that would raise about $25 billion um, over the next uh, 20 to 30 years about a billion a year and some of that money could be used uh, to backfill the general fund uh, and also uh, would go towards transportation projects and other projects. So um, the reason I tell you that in detail basically is because we are going to see a uh, several dueling uh, proposals uh, on, on a carbon tax that would also uh, impact the transportation uh, budget. So. We're going to watch that very carefully because transportation issues, obviously, for any port, uh, doesn't matter where it's located, is one of the top priorities that that we will be uh, participating in and and uh, and monitoring very closely uh, during session. Uh, one of the last things I will um, mention is that uh, we had a we we were contacted by the Northwest uh, Marine Trade Association, uh, Peter Strappen. And uh, they are uh, pushing forward with a bill uh, that would um, relieve uh, chartered yacht uh, vacations from having to pay the sales and use tax on 
the entire cost of a boat, um, which if you think about that and, and uh, Rob and Mike have been on a call uh, with me with, with the Northwest Marine uh, Trades Association Executive Director, he used the example of if you're on a $50 million yacht, a uh, $5 million uh, bill for that vacation is a big number. And so what's happening is uh, those boats are stopping at the Port of Bellingham uh, on their way to Alaska or Southern California um, or other international destinations, but people are not physically getting on the boat uh, at the Port of Bellingham. So uh, we are going to uh, participate in that bill. Uh, we're going to offer our support, uh, have conversations with all of our, our legislators from the uh, 40th and 42nd and others uh, in leadership and on committees. Uh, but that would be a, a big help uh, to the local economy if we could attract some of those uh, yacht, chartered yacht uh, trips and have them actually get, physically get on the boat. Uh, it's probably not a game changer, but it would definitely be a positive uh, for the local economy. So um, that's that's sort of a late addition um, to one of the, you know, for, for one of the priority issues. Um, there will be also just very briefly, I know we're uh, getting to sort of to the end of our time, but there will be several uh, tax proposals that are looked at uh, and we will monitor those uh, and keep you updated. Um, capital gains, uh, business and occupation taxes, those are all gonna be uh, part of the, the larger budget discussion uh, that we wanna make sure that everyone is aware of uh, going forward as how it will impact some of our issues also. So I'll leave it there. Uh, if I've missed something, uh, happy to answer questions. And thanks again for the time. Really appreciate everybody's time. All right, <clears throat> thank you both. Um, questions or comments, Commissioner Briscoe? No, I'd still, that, that, that's a bucket fully explained there. I, you know, there's always questions about, and he kind of covered that a little bit with the money escaping from mock into the general fund. I mean, that's always a big leak. We can't seem to get our fist in it to slow it down sometimes. Uh, we are definitely going to have to uh, make our new legislator in the 42nd aware of, of all the ins and outs. Um, she's new. Uh, I think she could use a lot of help from you guys. And I hope that she will accept it and ask for it. Because uh, it's a pretty complex situation she's uh, she's worked her way into here. I hope it works out good for her. Uh, thanks for your efforts and uh, staying on top of things. Uh, trying to to make a port operate and work is a is a big job for our executive director as well as the commission and staff. And any help we can get from you guys on the inside knowledge of where we need to be and what we're looking at is is greatly appreciated. Thank you. We, we really appreciate that, uh, Commissioner. Um, and uh, just sort of in follow-up to uh, the new member that was elected, uh, Representative Rule, uh, I've already reached out to her. Um, so we're, we're already establishing that, that relationship in, in the short time that we've had so far. Good. That's all I have, Commissioner Great. Shepard. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Bell. I echo what Bobby just said. Um, Two things, um, making sure that everybody understands that the port is very different from a legislative body, that we are strictly economic development. Uh, um, I think that needs to be hammered home. Um, our job is to create jobs. Our job is to be an economic development driver and not a legislative body, nor is the port supposed to be a pool of money to um, create or to advance social agendas. Right, um, we're here to create work. So your help in that would be greatly appreciated. Um, last thing, hey Tom, did you approve that haircut that Ben's got? <laughs> you know, well, it's it's been the subject of some conversation. I can tell you that. This is, you know, I was gonna I was gonna try and get a get ahead of that comment actually when I started talking. <laughs> uh, that the brewery know, is that the brewery do? I was very disappointed that uh, you're not on video because, you know, we always look forward to seeing your face. And then basically I was trying to balance out the hair profile of what Frank and Brian have going on. <laughs> yeah, but, but, but ben, you know how old you are? <laughs> yeah. Oh, dear. 
I'm done. Thanks. Digress. <laughs> no, seriously, John. Let, let's make sure that that people understand, especially the the, the new legislators, that we are an economic development driver uh, and not a legislative body. That's a big deal for me. Thanks. Yeah, and it, it you know that is a it's a misunderstood issue sometimes with the with the with the ports are designed to do. You're right, and uh, and and these days it's going to be more important than ever with our coming out of this uh, difficult economic environment. Yeah, and Ken, I just want to to reiterate, you know. Uh, the majority of what we've talked about transportation package projects uh maca uh cleanup projects all of those uh issues are that are our priorities uh for the port of bellingham uh all of those are, are really is a way to make sure that there is um additional jobs additional uh, uh funding for projects uh you know, either in Whatcom County or at the Port of Bellingham to make sure that there is funding for additional jobs. So um, we will we will take your message and and you know reiterate it and and um, talk to our legislators about that. But um, that really is our focus to make sure that that funding continues as it is already on the books and to increase that funding uh, to our best ability. Great, thanks. Yeah, and I'll just echo that um, importance of that those state transportation dollars. I, I know it's going to be a complex um, topic for our legislators to work through this this term, but I just give a perspective from the ports. I participated in a committee from with the uh, Washington Public Ports Association with um, commissioners throughout the state to look at transportation funding and to look at utilization of carbon tax. Um, or some sort of carbon pricing mechanism to fund that. And it was it was a difficult task for the WPPA to engage in. They had never engaged in a, a real discussion about um, a position on carbon for our organization. We reviewed lots of different options. We talked to ports um, across the West Coast and building uh, industry experts and policy experts. And we, we came up with a, a a policy guideline for the association that we support um, funding of a transportation package that in, can include funding from a carbon pricing scheme. So it, it involved a lot of review from um, members of the uh, staff and other uh, commissions throughout the state that looked at this and recognized the importance uh, for our economy of that work. You know, it's interesting because you think Ben talked about this, but the long session, the 105 day session, the budgets, there's three budgets. You know, there's the capital budget, the operating budget and transportation budget. And typically over the years, we haven't had big transportation revenue package packages move through the process. There's always a push for it, but it takes years to get them. But you, Commissioner, just Commissioner Shepard just talked about that. that it's the carbon issue that's really providing some energy and synergy on this issue. And it's it's really complicated. It can be really controversial, but it is keeping transportation, uh, transportation revenue package on the table. And that's 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 a good thing. It, it'll it be hard, it, you know, in a difficult environment like this to get the transportation revenue package alongside potentially operating revenue issues can be difficult, but it's it's definitely on the table still. Something we're working on closely. Great. Well, um, we'll certainly be looking to you for some help with how we make Port Day happen this year. I think it's in February, how we do that remotely and how we stay in touch with our counterparts in, in Olympia to make sure our voices are heard. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. All right, any other uh, questions or comments before we move on? Oh, no, just, hey, Ben, tell me who the barber is because I'm gonna get one like it. <laughs> but we'll, be, we'll be walking down. Yeah, that's, they won't know who's you and who's me. That's uh, that's courtesy of my wife. So you, I'm coming over. He's been doing the haircuts around here. <laughs> this is Frank. I can cut your hair, no problem. <laughs> I see that. Hey, do you still have the same bowl, Frank? Yeah, that'll fit, Ken. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you all. Um, we'll move on to our public comment um, period here. Um, if anyone would like to provide public comment, you can raise your hand or let yourself be known. 
anyone? Let's see, looking on both screens here. I don't see anyone um, for public comment. I don't either. Okay. Sure. Um, I will have us take a, a break until 10 till. Okay. And we'll I heard somebody try to chime in. Oh, let's one more call. I think Go that was once. me. I was just saying I didn't see anyone either. Yeah. Okay. All right. We'll take a uh, about a 10 minute break until uh, 10 till and we'll come back for action items.
And Ken looks like he's here as well. Good. All right, um, Carrie, if you would start us out with our first action item. Okay, Michael, I sent you a text and I'm not sure if you got it, but we're gonna move three to one. I'll read the motion. Motion by the Port Commission to approve an option agreement between the Port of Bellingham and ABC Recycling Carrie, if you're talking, you're muted. What? Oh, I think there, you have to do something so we can... Can you hear me? Can you guys hear me, Commission? I can hear you. And I, I can, can hear you fine. I can hear Carrie fine. That's weird. Okay. Michael, well, can you hear me? It's a Michael issue. Mm. Huh. That's weird. That's can you weird. hear Carrie, Michael? Carrie, are you there to start us out? Is my audio not working? or? Yeah, you can't hear us, but we Michael, can hear you. Michael, can you hear us? Oh. I am sorry, my audio is not working. I was probably just talking over everybody. Yeah. Now, <laughs> I was just standing there, like staring. Okay. I'll, I'll I don't know what I'm talking to, but you weren't answering. Yeah. <laughs> Got right, it. We'll start over. That's here. what how, what I All get right. for turning off my audio while I'm gone. Okay. Okay. Here we um, go. So I'm just moving item three up. Motion by the Port Commission to approve an option agreement between the Port of Bellingham and ABC Recycling Operations Corp for 5.97 acres of property located in the log prond area, plus rights to use the Bellingham, Bellingham shipping terminal on a non-exclusive basis. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I have... Mike, uh, who's doing this one? Chris, Chris Clark. Um, good evening, Commissioners. Chris Clark, uh, Business Development Manager for the Bellingham Shipping Terminal. And I'm pleased to have um, four guests with us tonight. We have um, uh, uh, three gentlemen from ABC Recycling. We have, um, we have uh, David um, Yaklowitz and we have Mike Yaklowitz and we have Andy Anthony. They're all on the screen below. And we also have Joe Schmidt from Local 7 who um, offered comments previously. So we welcome our guests um, tonight. And what I'm going to do now is um, if it's acceptable to commissioners to share the screen. And I have got a couple of slides. Sounds great. Okay, I will proceed. Um, <clears throat> Do you see the uh, presentation? We do. I can see it, Chris. Okay, good. Um, so tonight it's the ABC Recycling Port of Bellingham option agreement. With commissioner's approval, ABC and the Port of Bellingham will enter into an option agreement allowing ABC the right to lease 5.97 acres of land in the log pond area adjacent to the Bellingham shipping terminal. During the term of the agreement, ABC will pay the port a monthly option fee of $2,500 commencing <clears throat> December 1st, 2020. That's right, it's backdated to December 1st and running for a term of two years with the ability for ABC to extend for an additional six months. The agreement provides ABC the right to um, exercise the option into a lease for an initial term of 15 years with one 10 year term extension. Now, <clears throat> jobs and cargo operations, we've, we've discussed ABC in the past and now we can flesh it out uh, on a more definite basis. ABC's processing facility in Whatcom County will employ 23 people full time at family wage jobs at commencement of operations, ramping up to 33 full time employees by year three. Once operations commence at the log pond, an additional three ABC employees will be stationed and working there. Projected cargo volumes of 102,000 metric tons in the first year of operations consisting of 12 barge and two ship calls. By year three of operations, projected cargo volumes of 222,000 metric tons consisting of 12 barge and six ship calls. As far as Local 7 is concerned, employment of approximately six ILWU longshoremen per barge call and 14 per ship call at the Bellingham shipping terminal. 
the log use, pro the log pond property use, we've reviewed this before, but let me reiterate. It's to stockpile finished scrap metal for bulk cargo shipment, no cargo processing on this site or anywhere on port property to move the material from the log pond to the Bellingham shipping terminal. ABC finished scrap metal will be clean, homogeneous blend of steel products free from any surface contaminants. It will not contain any oils, fuels, or other hydrocarbons. This is a, a photo here uh, taken recently in, in Vancouver, Washington of this product um, on the berth there. Now we have an- um, Hey Chris, one interruption. Yeah. Did you say Vancouver, yes, sir? Washington or Canada? No, Vancouver, Washington. Um, yeah, uh, this, these products are not loaded in, in the Vancouver area, and that's what uh, basically due to, to the lack of space and facilities there, and that's what made Bellingham attractive to ABC. And ABC um, is a Canadian company based in, in Burnaby and uh, actually is the largest uh, recycle, metal recycling company in Western Canada. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Um, anticipated uh, income analysis, this is once the option is exercised. So we have year one of the lease, um, well, the numbers there speak for themselves, anticipated net income to the port of just over $600,000. And then um, by year three of the lease, with the ramping up um, of the, the, the cargo um, incoming and outgoing, we anticipate net income of $1,200,000 to the port. Uh, we do have a penalty clause in the contract and uh, should a volume of, of 60,000 metric tons not be shipped in one year, ABC will pay the port the difference between the volume shipped and received and the 60,000 metric ton at the throughput rate. And lastly, uh, I know this is a, a, a brief presentation. Um, any questions um, for ourselves or the, the guests? Thank you, Chris. I like brief. Um, let's go ahead and have any questions, Commissioner Bell. I have to unmute. Uh, I have none. Um, just as a, a personal preference, um, gentlemen, I, uh, I bought the uh, Weyerhaeuser plant from uh, Weyerhaeuser in New Westminster years ago, and your reputation is sterling. Um, so we're happy to have you here. All right. Thanks for those words, uh, Commissioner Briscoe. Yeah, Chris, uh, you've been working on this quite a while. Uh, yeah, please yeah. roll. Uh, it's been a process, but um, we're very grateful to the support that we've gotten from the gentleman at ABC. Uh, Andy is going to be the site manager. He's he's American, and uh, so he'll be the Andy. Is that you could unmute yourself if you want? Is that your correct title in in Bellingham? Or um... well. People call me various things, but right now I'm, I'm the I'm the project manager. Oh, that's right. I'm, at, excuse at, me. At this point, but that that will evolve. Yeah. Uh huh. I see. Okay. Good. Well, gentlemen, thanks for coming to Bellingham and doing do bit to do business with us. I hope we can meet your expectations as well as you meet our expectations. Um, and I'd like to see a long term thing, long past the uh, past when I'll be a commissioner and. And into into the grandkids' future. I hope your company's here doing business because we certainly do need it. So thank you. And Chris, you, you think this is a good deal, Chris? I'm asking you. I think it's a fabulous deal, and because it it really covers the well, it covers the um, the realm of the things that we're trying to do. It it it's jobs, jobs uh, in Bellingham, uh, in the county, and it's jobs on site. It's uh, revenue for the shipping terminal, cargo for the shipping terminal, and it's long-term employment for our friends at Local 7. And uh, so it, it it covers all aspects of the positive things that we want to do here. Okay, thank you. Good job, Chris. Thank you, gentlemen.
Yep. Um, one, yep. one last question. The, the jobs, you expect most of those people to be local people or people hired from the vicinity here, Whatcom County, or were you bringing folks down from BC? Uh, we, we will source most of our full-time employees from the, from the Washington state area, either, either Bellingham or Whatcom County general area. That will be our first, our first scope of, of search. Absolutely. Okay. Very good. Thanks gentlemen. Well, good. Well, um, I appreciate the uh, investment as well, both here at our facility and then at the um, uh, other property on Marine Drive. It speaks highly of your commitment to our region and, and our economy. Um, we've been working for several years and multiple commissions to refurbish and revitalize this shipping terminal so it's ready for operations like yourself. And um, if there are additional needs that um, can make this a, a really useful um, facility for you, please make sure you let us know. And one in, in particular I'm interested in is if we have sufficient shore power to be able to accommodate the types of vessels that are coming in um, that you might expect to be having here. Um, I think Dave can speak to that. Are you with us, Dave? Order? Yes, I just have to click all the right buttons. <laughs> just like everybody else. There we go. Uh, good evening, uh, Dave Ward, Marine Terminals and Emergency Services Manager. Uh, currently, we uh, we're obviously we have a project on the capital budget to increase the power uh, to the pier, uh, which we're hoping then vessels can run completely off of that power. Uh, the power that's there now would definitely support the cargo operations, uh, but until the, the, the capital project to revitalize the power supply uh, at the facility, then then we'd obviously be looking to uh, power vessels when they're when they're here. It, is that included in the grant we received, or is that a separate capital expenditure? That was in the budget, but there's still some discussion with the uh, with Merad on on the grant in the, uh, the different criteria. And Chris is probably a little more in the know on that, so we're we're tag teaming this definitely. Well, Commissioner, we're we're certainly um, endeavoring to have Merad include that, um, but we haven't gotten their commitment, their specific commitment letter yet. But we're going to uh, keep trying in that regard. Okay. And one last question, um, you know, we work real hard to maintain our stormwater facilities um, and control all runoff. Um, I just wanted to know how um, this product from what I've seen is uncovered and are we confident that we're able to maintain the stringent requirements that we face with the state around uh, stormwater with uh, the product on site in an uncovered manner? Well, uh, probably Brian could speak to this better than I, but I've been uh, involved in extensive discussions with his department and everyone felt comfortable that that could be done. Okay, well, good. That's what I'm looking for. Um, well, I wanted to thank you guys. Did um, any of you guests who are here have any things you would like to add or contribute? You're welcome to unmute yourself. You spent your time waiting for us to get around to this action item, so. Yeah, um, yeah Commissioner, I'd just like to say, number one, we're we're thankful for the opportunity. We're excited for this, this uh, project to come forward in, in the two to two and a half year projected range we have. Um, it fits our, it's kind of part one of two of our, our plan to to expand into the U.S. operations, give us give us that next step in vertical integration to become an end processor in our industry with the bulk export um, um, availability as well. So it's it's a really key step in expansion, and and uh, we're we're looking forward to getting involved with the community in Whatcom County, Bellingham as well. So we just want to thank you guys for the opportunity. Thank Chris Clark for for all of his help and assistance and patience. It's been a lot. It's been a little bit of a process but it's been very positive from start to finish and we're finally where we want to be. And we appreciate everybody's help very much. Does Thank you, Andy. Have, um, yeah, we're very excited to uh, to come down into your community and partner with you. And uh, we're very excited about the long-term uh, partnership and we're looking very forward to, um, to making partnerships within the community as well. So thank you very much. 
I just want to echo what uh, David and Andy have said. Uh, we really appreciate uh, you having us here, and we look forward to a long-term, very uh, mutually beneficial relationship. Thank you. Thank you. You're good. All right. Any uh, further questions or comments on this one? I have none. All right. Hearing none, Carrie, if you please. Sure. Motion by the Port Commission to approve an option agreement between the Port of Bellingham and ABC Recycling Operations Corp for 5.97 acres of property located in the Long Pod area plus rights to use the Bellingham shipping terminal on a non-exclusive basis. All right, Commissioner Briscoe. Yes. Commissioner Bell. Yes. And Commissioner Shepard is a yes as well. Thank you guys. All right, we'll circle back to action item one, Carrie. Okay. A motion authorizing the executive director to execute an infrastructure agreement with Corex Utility System Inc. to provide district energy on Bellingham's downtown waterfront. All Good right, evening. looks like Mike Hogan is on deck here. Good evening, commissioners. Uh, Mike Hogan, Public Affairs Administrator. I'll uh, pull up my presentation here. And are we able to see this? Yes. Yes, we are. Okay. Sorry, one second here. All right. Um, today, port staff are pleased to bring for your consideration an infrastructure agreement with Corex Utilities to advance the development of a district energy system for the waterfront district. I'm pleased to welcome Ivana Safar and Travis Hick Hickford Kulak with Corex who are listening in and I, I will invite them to say a few words at the end of my presentation. The port first started investigating district energy as a sustainable energy solution for the waterfront district shortly after acquiring the Georgia Pacific property in 2005. Many community stakeholders pointed towards the large amount of waste heat being released from Puget Sound Energy's Enkigen plant and asked if it would be possible to recapture the steam and use it to heat new buildings on the waterfront. Early discussions included Port City and Western Washington University staff talking with PSE representatives about the opportunity to enhance the efficiency of Western's energy systems to repower downtown municipal buildings and to provide heating for new buildings on the waterfront. As the citizens of Whatcom County took part in discussions to build a neighborhood of the future on Bellingham's downtown waterfront, District Energy caught on as a unique opportunity to do something different and do something better. District Energy was discussed as part of lead for neighborhood development planning, eco districts, and in other sustainability for forums, and the local nonprofit organization Sustainable Connections became an early champion for this strategy to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and curb global warming. The concept of District Energy is simple. Instead of having a heating and cooling system for each building, multiple buildings are connected to a single centralized system which distributes heating and cooling to individual buildings through pipes which typically contain heated or chilled water. Buildings are one of the largest sources of greenhouse gas emissions to our atmosphere, which are primarily released by burning fossil fuels to supply heating and cooling, either directly in furnaces or indirectly through power generation. When buildings are individually heated, there are not many green options. But when connected to a district energy system, you unlock a range of technological solutions such as biomass, sewage, seawater, or waste heat from sources like PSE's Enkajin plant. During the waterfront master planning process, Sustainable Connections organized tours for port and city officials to learn more about the benefits of district energy by looking at systems in British Columbia, including Dockside Green. Uh, sorry, is, are the slides advancing for you guys? No, they're not. Oh. <coughs> uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and I'm going to go ahead and take it. Do I have this slideshow here? Uh, I don't. How about how about now? Yep, now you got it. Yep, that good. works. Yep. Okay. Sorry about that. It was on the uh, screen share. Um, yeah, so, so Sustainable Connections organized tours um, to Dockside Green up in British Columbia, Simon Fraser University, the University of British Columbia and Olympic Village. Um, 
uh, building serviced by district energy systems do not require the installation or maintenance of equipment such as furnaces, boilers, chillers, or air conditioners. The space taken up by HVAC equipment is freed up and building operators don't need to worry about equipment failures inside their buildings. DE systems are resilient and can often keep running through storms and extreme weather, which often knock out electricity needed to run many traditional heating systems. That's why they're often hooked up to places like hospitals that can't afford to lose power. Partnerships have been critical towards advancing sustainable energy solutions on the waterfront. In 2013, the Port and City worked together to include language in the waterfront development regulations with states, if available, all new development within the downtown waterfront shall connect to district energy. In 2014, Port and City staff worked together on the city's waterfront utility master plan, which included an in-depth look at sustainable utilities, including district energy, district water, micro hydro, and district stormwater. Despite the tremendous opportunities provided by district energy, there are significant challenges which has prevented widespread implementation. District energy systems require a significant upfront cost to install the required infrastructure and are a challenge for projects like the waterfront district with little density and a long-term projected build out. To overcome this challenge and deliver on the community's vision, the port utilizes its ability to invest patient capital with a long-term return on investment and install four pipe district energy infrastructure under Laurel Street while the new road was under construction. If district energy pipes had not been installed under Laurel Street, the development of a DE system would never have happened. In addition to the environmental benefits, the port recognized there were long-term economic development opportunities associated with the development of a district energy system. ITEC Solar moved the largest solar panel manufacturing plant in Washington to Bellingham's waterfront in part because the company was excited to be part of clean energy discussions. Clean tech and clean energy are rapidly growing sectors of the economy and district energy is a market differentiator which may attract like-minded companies. There are also future research and development opportunities associated with Western Washington University's Institute for Energy Studies and the development of a district energy power plant is a significant investment in and of itself. In 2018, the port selected Quark's utilities to develop an implementation strategy based on a recommendation of a selection committee which included representatives of the port, the city, Western Washington University, Puget Sound Energy, and Sustainable Connections. Corix is an established international leader in district energy utilities, and we were pleased to work with Corix to develop a financially feasible strategy which will deliver energy rates to end users commensurate with market rates while, support, while supporting Whatcom County's economic and environmental goals. The implementation strategy outlined in the infrastructure agreement includes strategic phasing to meet the load requirements of the waterfront while deploying capital on a just-in-time basis when there is sufficient load and density levels based on the anticipated development schedule. A biomass boiler is proposed as an interim solution to meet the needs of the first several buildings on the waterfront, and the biomass system will reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 60% compared to business as usual. Around 2028, or when required by density, Quarks will develop a permanent energy plant in the same location using an alternative energy source. Clean energy and clean energy research is a rapidly evolving field, so no decisions have been made about the permanent solution. However, waste heat from the city's sewer main and waste heat from Puget Sound Energy's Encogen plant will definitely be part of the conversation. The permanent renewable energy solution for the waterfront is estimated to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by at least 85% compared to conventional systems. This phase strategy is similar to an approach which has been used in many district energy systems in Canada, including Simon Fraser University, where a $33 million biomass permanent solution was just completed. Some highlights for the infrastructure agreements. It gives exclusive rights for Corks to install and operate district energy utilities. Corks will purchase the port's investment in district energy pipes, um, paying the port up to 1.4 million over the next six years. Corks will build and maintain the required infrastructure for the build out of the district energy system, and developers will be charged a connection fee of $1.60 per square foot for heating and $1.60 cents per square feet of cooling. And that price will be adjusted annually per the consumer price index. 
there will be a future ground lease for the port for the interim and permanent power plant. Um, the location, it will be next to the Puget Sound Energy's Enkajin plant. Uh, that's an exhibit to the infrastructure agreement. Um, there will also be, we're retaining an option to contribute funding to support renewable technologies, similar to the port's investment in the piping for the system. When it comes time to implement the permanent solution, if we can bring grants to bear to reduce the, reduce the capital investment or work with the city or use a patient capital to meet um, community objectives at that time, we wanted to retain that uh, option. And then the port also agrees that the waterfront sub area plan and master development agreement will re remain substantively unchanged. Uh, in between receiving your packets and the meeting today, there have been a few minor housekeeping changes to the infrastructure agreement that we wanted to highlight for you. These are in order of the section revised. On page one, Horrocks' address was changed from Vancouver to Chicago to reflect the entity's actual address. On page eight, section 1.7, the definition of exhibit H was revised from a regulatory framework for a district energy utility to a district energy systems for consistency purposes. On page 12, section 6.2, uh, we deleted the se second sentence on what happens if the law changes to regulate the system since that was already covered in section 19.8 and 19.9, and we wanted to prevent inadvertent inconsistency between the two provisions. And then on page 19 in sections 13.1 and 13.4, we added that any applicable umbrella insurance coverage was included. Um, and then on page 30, section 20.1, we updated the contact information for notices and added that notices can be sent via email. Uh, I also wanted to highlight the regulatory framework, which is exhibit H to the infrastructure agreement, um, is the district energy system in Washington is not regulated by law. We have drafted a framework to create a fair rate setting process to ensure this is a viable utility that charges fair and equitable rates for service. This process sets up an independent panel to review rates and it is based on various regulatory agencies best practices. For example, it authorized the rate setting panel to use UTC regulations to help them. This framework governs Quarks's relationships with its customers and the port is not involved other than to participate in the process to select panel members. We note that this unregulated situation is very unique. In fact, we were not able to find an analogous situation. To that end, we had an independent consultant who focuses on utility rates do a peer review of the document. They found it to be a model and creative way of addressing a unique situation. With that said, we understand and we are anticipating issues that may evolve and change as the implementation begins. Accordingly, the regulatory framework is intended to be a living document that will require revisions. Corex is a solid partner in this effort and we will continue to evolve the document as we move the project forward. Of course, we will keep the commission informed as we learn, adapt and evolve with the framework. With that, I wanna again thank our partners at Sustainable Connections, the City of Bellingham, Western Washington University, Puget Sound Energy, and all the members of the community who have championed a sustainable energy solution for the waterfront. Um, and I'd also like to invite uh, Ivana Safar and Travis Hickford Kulak with Corex to say a few words before you vote on the proposed infrastructure agreement. Good evening, can everyone hear me? Yes, we can hear you fine. Excellent. Hello, everyone. My name is Travis Hickford Kulak. I'm the president of Energy Services uh, with Corex Group of Companies. Uh, thank you for having us here tonight. Uh, this has been a tremendous opportunity to work on this, and it's been an absolute pleasure uh, working with Port staff, Harcourt, the city, and all the other stakeholders um, that have been involved throughout this process. As the process has unfolded, um, it's been a true reflection of the leadership, um, the, the sound leadership um, of the port, and it showcases uh, a strong sense of stewardship for, for the environment. We believe that this will be the foundation of what will become a legacy um, for Bellingham. And this is definitely an example 
of of vision, purpose, and drive. Um, without those three pieces, none of this um, would have been able to happen um, to the point where we are today. We very much look forward to becoming a part of the community in Bellingham and helping the waterfront uh, district thrive um, based on the current plan and then whatever the future may hold and, and bring. Um, so thank you very much uh, for having us here tonight. And Mike, thanks very much for taking us through that presentation. Thanks, Travis. Um, thank you. Uh, this is Ivana Safar from Corix. Uh, I have been in front of the commission for a couple of times <laughs> presenting the project. So I just want to, again, Travis said it all. We are, we are so grateful for all support throughout the process and very happy that we got to this, uh, to this stage, uh, hopefully of approval of the agreement and we cannot wait to start building. So, and provide the energy. So yeah, hopefully everything goes well. And uh, again, thank you everybody for the support and we are really looking forward to become part of the community. Well, and commissioners, we have all the right people. And if you have any questions about the infrastructure agreement um, or any of the technologies that were looked at or uh, what, what the next steps will be moving forward. Um, but again, I, I just really can't thank enough uh, the partners in the community and at Sustainable Connections. I talked to Derek Long to give him an update and, you know, he couldn't have been more happy and more proud of, of where we've started and where we've come to. And, and uh, uh, we've, we've come to a, a, a phased approach that, you know, <clears throat> key is that the energy rates are, are commensurate with traditional systems for the end users. And uh, it, it really sets it up to be a market differentiator down on the waterfront. So uh, a lot of progress and we're happy to answer any questions. All right, thank you very much. Any questions or comments, uh, Commissioner Bell? You're muted if you're talking, Commissioner. Um, we'll move on for Commissioner uh, Briscoe. We'll come back to you, Commissioner Bell. Any questions or comments? No, I'd just like to thank everyone for the the time invested in this. Uh, it's, it's definitely something that's it's good for our, uh, our community, good for our environment. You know, take our grandchildren or great grandchildren into the future cleanly, and that's a good thing. Thank you all. Yeah, and, and I'm glad you, Mike, that you highlighted that um, clause about our interaction on the, the project moving forward. We've got a dynamite team who's able to really leverage our unique re relationship with local government, our state government, or our federal partners to bring resources to the table through grants or other initiatives to get that permanent solution bought down to a manageable price. So we're able to get something really innovative and something really exciting uh, to make um, the district energy um, work to its best potential. Well, thank you for that, Commissioner. I want to say that as we, in the original um, plan, we had, you know, the temporary moving to the permanent and really viewed the permanent as the opportunity to bring in the renewable technologies. And, and I was having some conversation with Seth Vidani over at the city and he was like, gosh, you know, isn't there anything we could do in the temporary solution that would be, um, good now, you know, we wouldn't have to wait. And uh, <clears throat> so I pushed our team, you know, to say, hey, look, what, what, a, and, and to their credit, they found the, the biomass solution, which is a 65% reduction in greenhouse gases in the short term. And so um, talking with, with Seth over the city, we just, you know, the, I think the key is just having the right people in the room, having those conversations moving forward um, to, to keep asking questions and, and seeing what we can do as a community and then bringing that information back to our uh, elected officials at the port and at the city and, and looking for leadership and, and looking for opportunities moving forward. So, so thank you for that. Yeah, I, I was keyed into that. I remember the last time Ivana was here, we were mostly talking about a natural gas fired um, production for that interim solution. So being able to move that needle to the biomass is, is a is significant step. Um, we, we had a public comment earlier that I just, I didn't know the answer to, so I'll ask it again. It was about um, prevailing wage uh, re 
for work on the site. Um, and I don't, I don't know this being a private project on public land. Um, I don't know the answer to that question about prevailing wage uh, employment um, on Corex projects. Frank Schmelick is on. Maybe he can comment. <clears throat> yes, Commissioner. So, um, prevailing wage is a term of art, uh, meaning a wage established by the state of Washington for public work projects. And a public work project is a project on uh, uh, government owned property at the cost of the government. And so, um, both those elements have to occur. And so here, uh, you know, as, as we go forward, this evolves, but as it stands now, this project's not gonna be built at the cost of the government. Uh, it's gonna be built at the cost of Corex. Uh, and that's true also of the Harcourt projects. They're, Harcourt's a bit different, they buy the property, so it's no longer even government property when they build. Uh, but we pay prevailing wage, which roughly equates to union wages on public work projects that, that the port does every year. Okay. All right. Thank you for that clarification. Uh, Commissioner Bell, did you have any further questions or comments? So it seems like we've lost uh, Commissioner Bell. Uh, the commission is going to have to make a decision if you want to keep going forward without him. My recommendation would be you do for item one and two. Those seem to be necessary. If we don't have Commissioner Bell back by the time we get to items four or five in the IDC, those can probably be postponed until January. I'm back, Rob. Oh, there he is. He's back. All right. So I have no comments. I'm in favor. Okay. Great. Well, Thank you all. Um, Carrie, if you please. A motion authorizing the executive director to execute an infrastructure agreement with Corex Utility System, Inc. to provide district energy on Bellingham's downtown waterfront. All right, Commissioner Bell? Yes. Commissioner Briscoe? Yes. And I am yes as well, Carrie's 3-0. Thank you all. <clears throat> Uh, moving on to action item two, Carrie, if you please. A motion to approve resolution number 1391B, incorporating attachments from the Port of Bellingham strategic budget, which itemize proposed capital projects from the 2021 five-year capital budget forecast for inclusion into the comprehensive scheme of harbor improvements. All right, Mr. McHenry, thank you. Good evening, commissioners. Uh, Greg McHenry, senior planning analyst for the Port of Bellingham. Uh, no presentation this evening. As you're aware, we had a public hearing on November 17th, and there was no public comment. Since that time, uh, we've been in a 14-day SEPA comment period, and we've received no public comment on this action. Um, we did get um, some clarifying comments from our partners at DNR, which uh, staff was um, able to work through and, um, and has no bearing on the action you're about to take. So uh, this item is aligning our strategic budget and comp plan. Okay, thank you very much. Um, any questions or comments, Commissioner Briscoe? I have none. Uh, Commissioner Bell? I have none. All right, Carrie, if you please. A motion to approve resolution number 1391B, incorporating attachments from the Port of Bellingham strategic budget, which itemized proposed capital projects from the 2021 five-year capital budget Ooh. forecast for inclusion into the comprehensive scheme of harbor improvements. All right, uh, Commissioner Briscoe. Yes. Commissioner Bell. Yes. And I'm a yes as well, carries the real. All right, we are on to number four. Um, Carrie, if you please. Approval of a motion to appoint the following Port of Bellingham commissioners to serve as representatives 
trustees, or board members for the following organizations or committee during 2021. Whatcom Council of Governments, Washington Public Ports Association, Whatcom County Economic Development Investment Program Committee, and Western Crossing. In 2020, Bobby Briscoe was primary and Michael Shepard was the alternate for Whatcom County, uh, I mean, Whatcom Council of Governments. Do you guys want to talk amongst yourself on if you want to change that up or keep it the same. Yeah, I, I've i lost this page on in my files. Um, would you be able to put that up on the screen for us? Yep, I'm going to grab it right now. <clears throat> Give me just a second to get on the website, though, for the port. OK. I... Well, I'll ask a question while he's looking at this. Is, uh, are any of my fellow commissioners uh, unhappy with the positions we've held for the last year other than, than the president, vice president, secretary? Is everybody good with where they're at? I'm fine with the one. I've been doing the WPPA and I'm fine to continue um, working on um, taking the first position on that one. Why Rob is finding the page, I can just go over it quick. So the WCO. Oh, G. Yeah. Oh, there you go. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Rob. Hey, Bob. I, I'd, I'd like to uh, go into the uh, Council of Governments meetings a little more often. I've not been included in those. That's that's fine. I, if you want to switch up with that, that that's fine, Ken. Yeah, I'd love that. Would you take Western Crossing? <laughs> <laughs> Do you think they really want me? <laughs> uh, yeah, no, that's that's fine. I I like the uh, economic development um, EDI program, so I'd like to keep that one if I can. That's fine with me. Bobby, did you have any others you wanted? <laughs> No, I mean, I'm, I'm fine. It's, it, whatever works, I don't want to make a big deal out of any of this. If, if you got interest and you're in where you want to be, it's fine with me. Uh, any, any I'm, I'm interest, pretty easy on this stuff. Any interest in swapping uh, Michael Shepard at WPPA into Western Crossing and putting Bobby into WPPA? Oh, that works. I I haven't done Western Crossing before, so I wouldn't mind doing that myself. It's fine with me. Okay. So the way I've got this uh, is we've got uh, Commissioner Bell is going to be the lead on the Whatcom Council of Governments with Commissioner Shepard as the alternate. Commissioner Briscoe will be the lead on the WPPA with Commissioner Bell as the alternate. Commissioner Bell will continue. I've got a, I've got a question on a WPPA though, Rob. Yes, sir. Is that not supposed to be the president? No, it can be any one of the three of you. Okay, very good. I was unclear on that. Yep. No, it can be anyone. It doesn't have to be the president. You can appoint someone as well if you really didn't want to do it. No, I, it's fine. Uh, the EDI will continue to be Ken Bell as the primary and Bobby Briscoe as the secondary and Western Crossing will go to Commissioner Shepard as the primary and uh, I guess Commissioner Bell as the backup or would you prefer Commissioner Briscoe as the backup there? Whom are you asking, Rob? All three of you. It doesn't matter to me. Like I said, I'm easy. Whatever, whatever folks want to do. Yeah, no dog in that hunt, so I'm good. Let's leave Commissioner Bell as the, the backup there since he's got some experience there from the past year that might come in handy. Great, thanks. Okay. Well, um, I will... Carrie, would you... Um, read the motion again um, per those additions? Yes. Approval of a motion to appoint the following Port of Bellingham commissioners to serve as representatives, trustees, or board members for the following organizations or committee during 2021. You want me to recap the names? Okay. Let's do the primaries. Please. Okay, so I'll just read the primaries. So for... Whatcom Council of Governments, I have Ken Bell as primary. 
for Washington Public Ports Association. I have Bobby Briscoe as a trustee. Whatcom County Economic Development Investment Program Committee, I have Ken Bell as primary. Western Crossing, I have Michael Shepard as primary. Okay, any uh, final questions or comments? None for me. I have none. All right, uh, we'll go ahead and uh, move to the vote. Uh, Commissioner Briscoe? Yes. Commissioner Bell? Yes. And Commissioner Shepherds, yes as well. Thank you very much. Final action item, uh, Carrie, go ahead. Establish the Port Commission officers and board representatives for calendar year of 2021. All right, um, I've enjoyed uh, the opportunity to be commission president this year. Um, we typically rotate. And so I would um, propose that uh, Commissioner Bell rotates into this role. I, I honestly can't remember which, <laughs> if Bobby or I should move into vice or secretary. So um, whichever turn that is, is fine with me. Then I would agree with, with Michael as Ken Bell is president. Ken, is that all right with you? No, I left again. You have, you have two votes. <laughs> I don't get one. What's my option? Um, all right. And which are, who's vice and who's secretary right now? I'm vice and Ken is secretary. So you would move the vice and I would move the secretary if we're rotating. If was, it, it does, and like I said, it really doesn't make any difference to me. I am, I'm just fine with what Bobby suggested. Okay, so Ken Bell is president, Michael Shepard is vice president, and Bobby Briscoe is secretary. I'm good with that. Okay. All right, Carrie, if you would uh, read motion again. Select commission officers to serve as president, vice president, and secretary for the Port of Bellingham Board of Commissioners for the 2021 calendar year. All right, uh, Commissioner Briscoe? Yes. Commissioner Bell? Yes. And Commissioner Shepard is yes as well. All right, carries three zero. Um, that is, works us through our action items. I am now going to recess the public meeting to open the Industrial Development Corporation IDC board meeting. We have four tasks ahead of us. Um, Carrie, we do you read these for us, Carrie? Or generally, no, but I can. Oh, <clears throat> okay. Our first task is to select officers for the Industrial Development Corporation board of directors for the 2021 calendar year and I would propose those mirror our commission roles. With the addition of the treasurer, which is Tamara Sobjack. <clears throat> With the addition of the treasurer, Ooh. of Tamara Sobjack. Okay, do we vote on these individually or do we vote on all of these together? I'd do them individually just for the sake of doing them. Should be quick. What was that, Robert? I I'd go ahead and do them individually. It's, it'll be a quick vote. Okay. All right, uh, Carrie, would you read that motion then? Sure, select officers for the mm -hmm. IDC Board of Directors for 2021 calendar year. So that'll be Commissioner Bell as President, Commissioner Shepard as Vice President, and Commissioner Briscoe as Secretary, and Tamara Sobjack, the Port CFO, will serve as the IDC Treasurer. Okay, uh, Commissioner Briscoe? Yes. Commissioner Bell? Yes. Commissioner Shepard is a yes as well. Next is to establish a date, time, and location for the IDC meetings for 2021 calendar year. Do we have a proposal for that, Rob? Typically, we do that on an as-needed basis, so we establish it as needed. Okay. Um, Carrie, I'll go ahead and read that with the addition of it being as-needed. You want me to reread the motion? Sure. Okay. Establish a date, time, and location of the IDC meetings for the 2021 calendar year, just as needed. All right, Commissioner Bell? 
Yes. Commissioner Briscoe? Yes. Commissioner Shepard is yes. Item three, adopt the minutes for the IDC meeting held on December 10th, um, 2019. Uh, any discussion on those minutes? I have none. All right. Only we knew in 2019 what would happen in 2020. <clears throat> Who would have known, man? Okay, well, I, I've i already read the motion, I guess, so I don't think we need Carrie to read it again. So we'll just go ahead and vote. Uh, Commissioner Briscoe? Yes. Commissioner Bell? Yes. Commissioner Shepard is a yes. Fourth is authorize the 2021 budget for the IDC total in revenues and expenditures as outlined in the attached budget, which we have reviewed. Authorize the IDC treasurer to approve the distribution, distribution and payment of the IDC funds in conjunction with this budget. Questions or comments? I have none. Here. Here does, does she have to add a joke along with the budget when she? <laughs> Floor's yours, Tamara. Maybe we can amend a friendly amendment that there must be a joke called before the, uh, joke. Before the speech. Oh, you don't want my jokes. I'm here to answer any questions on this very complicated budget if you have them. <laughs> I have anybody in the financial world with a sense of humor. <laughs> All right. Um, we'll just go ahead and move to voting. Commissioner Bell? Yes. Commissioner Bill, uh, Briscoe? Yes. And I'm a yes as well. I will now close the IDC meeting and reconvene the, the public meeting and we are on to other business. All right, uh, Commissioner Briscoe, do you have any other business? No. And Commissioner Bell, do you have any other business? None. Rob, um, I have two items. First, we had, you and I had discussed um, potential impacts of um, the ongoing um, public health emergency and restrictions on indoor dining on our food um, and restaurant establishments that are port tenants. Um, do you have any update for us on how these businesses are doing and if they need any additional support from our organization? Yeah, they absolutely do, Commissioner, and thanks for bringing that up. Uh, the real estate department has put together a rent relief package for the restaurants that are on port property, and we'll bring you something uh, for action in early January on that. But uh, uh, several of them have come to us. Uh, most of them are not even open. Uh, so, yeah, we're going to have to take some sort of action there. Okay. Um, do you need anything from us at this time? No, sir. I will uh, be working with real estate to develop the policy. Uh, we'll brief you individually on that and then bring you an action in early January. Okay. All right. Um, I have uh, one additional, and um, this is, relates to on ongoing needs in, in our community around homelessness. Um, in order to, and I have a motion, in order to address the ongoing COVID-19 public health emergency in Whatcom County, it's come to our attention that the city of Bellingham and Whatcom County our, uh, government are looking to site a temporary tiny house encampment on Port property on Cornwall Avenue. I understand from Port staff that the property is currently under a month to month lease. And I also note that the Port and city um, and county are in discussion about numerous issues of mutual concern. And therefore, I make the following motion. It's a motion to authorize the executive director to enter into discussion with the city uh, for an interlocal agreement that addresses mutual issues of concern, including but not limited to the use of the Cornwall property for a temporary tiny home encampment with the following caveats. The port is able to find a suitable location for the current tenant. The use of port property is tied to the ongoing public health emergency not to exceed the end of April 2021 with an identified follow on site. The city of Bellingham Whatcom County will provide mobile shelters and identify and fund a qualified operator to manage the site. And finally, that the temporary encampment permit conditions are acceptable to the port. And I'd like to open that up for discussion. Commissioner Bell. Good with that. Commissioner Briscoe. I'm sorry, I didn't hear Commissioner Bell. What did he say? Good with that. 
Uh, I don't know if I'm good with it or not, given the, the past uh, responses we've had from the permitting department in the city of Bellingham for things that the port has tried to do for the public on uh, short-term notice in our COVID, COVID pandemic situation we're in. Our executive director has tried to do many things and I'm not, not very keen on, I'm returning favors to folks that don't seem to do favors to us. However, tis the season, Christmas is coming, the time of goodwill, so I'm good with that. Oh, we can take the Grinch label off of Bobby. <laughs> okay. Um, Rob, do you need a formal vote on this or is... I, I think uh, we need a vote, yeah. I think we'll we'll be bringing an action back to you, but let's just do a vote so that we've covered ourselves. All right. All right. Um, let's go ahead and vote on this. Uh, Commissioner Bell. Yes. Commissioner Briscoe. Yes. And Commissioner Shepard is a yes as well. Um, I want to just thank you both for um, thinking this through with us and for thinking about all the options um, I know, and also to our, our staff and legal department for providing us assistance on this. Um, we have tried to craft this with um, enough caveats that we're able to um, raise the important concerns that Commissioner Briscoe and others have um, brought forth um, while trying to do our part uh, for our community. We do a lot of parts already and we're doing some more parts, but that is part of uh, being in local government in this year. With that, I'll see one last call for any other items for this evening. Um, I may have one. Um, we discussed this uh, um, at some point, but uh, maybe Rob can help me out here. We have the, the, the situation of land with the boathouses. Do we need to uh, bring that forward with some bit of public discussion here? Uh, for the boathouses in Blaine, no. Um, that action is going to be taken by the attorneys and uh, the marina staff for the first run at it, and then we'll come back to you with the report out, and if we need further action, we'll take that in early January. Very good. Just want to clarify that in my head. I thought maybe we might have forgot. Thank you. Yep, you bet. I have, I have no further business, uh, Commissioner Ship. Thank you. And, and uh, I do, I do with this, this is our last meeting, correct? It is. Well, of the year. Okay. Well, yes, for the year. I will say, Michael, job well done. Thank you. Appreciate that. Yeah, Michael, that couldn't have been an easy year for you, uh, being the first time president and doing it over video. So nicely done. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm on video way too much. So uh, it's part of part of what I do, but I appreciate it. And it's um, been a good experience. Um, I eyes are starting to dilate and get circles in them. <laughs> I well, sincerely hope we do never we do not have another year like this in my lifetime, um, and I wish you all a safe and happy holiday. And um, a, a won't be hard to be better, but it's going to be a better new year. I guarantee it. <laughs> all right, Chris. Oh, yeah, we are adjourned. Michael, while you're while you're at it, yeah, the staff did an amazing job too this year. You know, 2020 was not easy. You know, Carrie had to do a bunch of things that were outside of the realm of her uh, scope of work. Rob had to um, work, you know, virtually most of the time. Seriously, this the staff of this port has been amazing. And uh, Rob, thanks for your leadership. Uh, Carrie, thanks for doing what you do in, in trying circumstances. But uh, Michael, it's not, they, they've done a great job, right? So thank you. Here, here. Totally. It's a pleasure to work with this community. And then people rise to the occasion when there's challenge. We've had a lot of challenge and there's been a huge amount of rising to the occasion. Yep. Thank you, All commissioners. Right. We've got an incredible right. team here at the port. Yeah. Well, we're adjourned. Happy holidays.